in America an alleged 564,000 people died over the last 30 years directly or indirectly by the use of a painkiller called OxyContin, through which the company, by the name of Purdue, earned 35 billion US dollars for killing mostly young Americans. And I will show you in this video how, as always, this is directly related to Switzerland, the Nazis and the Knights Templars, out of whom both the Nazis and Switzerland come out of the Knights Templars as these Swiss elite bloodlines who do great businesses with the deaths of our children are everywhere on key positions as the top echelons of politics. They hide everything from us to make it very hard for us to find any valid death statistics concerning their lucrative business of death by these global death dealers. So here you see clean and beautiful Switzerland, neutral of course, with the Swiss Templars flag in the Templars colors, red and white. And here it says 564,000 dead Americans and the Swiss connection of the criminal Alpine Empire. So let's do a little calculation, shall we now? OxyContin was brought on the market in 1995 and they stopped producing it in 2018, which is roughly the very same time of the US occupation of Afghanistan from 2001 to 2021, because OxyContin is an opioid. And Opioids need opium from Afghanistan. And as the good old Taliban had the opium trade and the opium production forbidden in 2001, and then again in 2021, it was a bit difficult to produce any opioids like OxyContin during those Taliban periods due to the scarcity of their basic ingredients from Afghanistan. It is therefore that the amount of OxyContin production years coincide with the amount of years of the US occupation of Afghanistan. So here you see how the US, they're pulling away the destroying Afghanistan from 2001 until 2021 which really coincides with the production years of here OxyContin by the Purdue Pharma industry from 1995 until 2018. Because this here, these pills need this country and the opium which is being produced in this country from here. So this here and the years is related to this here. 
And um, so don't you think this is a coincidence? Eh? The Afghan people have never done anything against the US population. They have never done anything against the Americans. But these ones here did so, murdering millions of Americans, probably. So the Afghan war has cost the lives of 564,000 Americans, but not exactly the way those media liars have told you. And once more, if the people in the US and the rest of the Western world would like to resolve the drugs problem, well, just import the Taliban, give them a US police uniform or the uniform of any other Western nation. Consequently, get rid of the entire corrupted Western Freemason police force and the Taliban dudes will solve the global drugs problem within 24 hours. I'll promise you that. And by the way, I'm not a Muslim. The CIA and the DEA only eliminate the competition, like South American drugs dealers, and they terminate the Taliban with those US Navy SEALs, because the Taliban have forbidden all drugs, while US killer cops only eliminate defenseless US citizens. So to the left, you see it says here US killer cops. Here you see one of those here. And to the right, it says Taliban drugs killers. Because the Taliban do not like drugs. These one here, and this whole organization, they protect the drugs and the big business that it gives to the elite. Oh, OxyContin was produced and on the market for 23 years, from 1995 to 2018. And it says that in 2008, there were in the US 14,800 deaths directly related and because of OxyContin. So in 20, instead of actual 23 years and 15,000 instead of 14,800, because I'm a lazy calculator, that will give 20 times 15,000 is 300,000 directly related deaths because of OxyContin. And if I'd add the other three years to it, we'll get at 345,000 OxyContin deaths in the US alone. And these are only the directly related OxyContin deaths in the US. So here it says death dealer OxyContin by Purdue Pharma, 23 years OxyContin. And you must be an oxymoron if you don't understand that an opioid like OxyContin is not 
add addictive because all opium based products are just plain addictive, meaning that the consequent OxyContin opioid addiction has lured millions of young people into serious drugs addiction, thus opening the back door for all kind of drugs like heroin, cocaine, crack, speed, amphetamines, ecstasy, the devastating fentanyl and whatnot. So here it says oxymoron and there he is. This is what an oxymoron looks like apparently. And on the other side oxycontin with a human being being trapped inside the pill. Like in the film, like in the movie. Here's the red pill, here's the blue pill. <laughs> trapped in the pill. Really diabolic. And it's all protected by the state, the elite, and the ones in power. And they're based in the Alps where all the money eventually goes to. I mean, OxyContin is to a drug addict what baby milk is to a newly born. And you must be an oxymoron if you don't understand this. Or maybe OxyContin makes oxymorons, right? So here's the comparison. This one here is milk addicted, which is a lot better. And this one here, it says here, killer, killer pharma, killer pharmaceuticals, attacks the brain. You know, it's, um, it's a war. And um, don't trust their poisons. Don't trust anything. You can trust me though, and the baby. So here is some information about the OxyContin here. It's uh, the old name is Oxycodone. So here it says Oxycodone sold under various brand names such as Oxycodone and OxyContin. Well, it's the same, you know, what they do with all these military organizations with which they attack us, you know, they just change uniforms and change names. Before it was the SS, now it is, um, and, and it was Hitler, now it is Putin and uh, the US Navy SEALs and, um, you know, they just change names all the time. They just hide and this is the same with oxycontin which used to be uh, oxycodone and it still exists you know so you can read it yourself here just punch pause as usual but here's about the uh, side effects respiratory uh, depression nervousness, abdominal pain, uh, or you name it, you know, everything you can imagine. Overdoses. And here's some pharmacology. Oh, I go a bit quicker, you know, you could, you can, Oh, there it is. This is what I wanted to tell you under history. Yeah. And upon its release in 1995, what I told you until 2018. Um, and um, here, oxycodone is the most, or oxycontin is the most widely recreationally used opioid. It's for recreation, yeah? 
In the United States, more than 12 million people use opioid drugs recreationally. And uh, 11 million use oxycodone, so that's uh, oxycontin. Uh, so this is what I wanted to show you. And the opioids, um, in 2007, um, it's about the uh, 42,800 emergency calls because of the oxycontin. In 2008, the oxycontin was involved in 14,800 deaths. So over 23 years, you know, that makes 345,000 deaths in the US only uh, due to uh, oxycontin. And there are even numbers like 464,000 deaths since 2001, they say. So th this is just the tip of the iceberg. I, it's, it's a lot more because, you know, they hide it and, you know, you know how they do it, you know. So these are, these are just, a, and there you have it in other countries here, Canada, United Kingdom. You know, it's, it's, it's everywhere, Germany, Hong Kong, Japan. You know, they try to hook like the whole world, uh, the, the youth of the entire globe on this poison. And it's all related to the Afghan war. Eh? So here's the chapter about the opioid epidemic. Uh, I mean, how is this possible, you know, with all these authorities, which what, what they have, you know, how, how can it go on and go on for 23 years and longer? Well, because it's all them, you know, they're in politics. They have all the big businesses. They are the elite. This is Pharaoh. Everything is them, the authorities, the politics, everything. You know, so this is why it's going on and it's going on. And here in the United States, from 1999, you know, that coincides with the Afghan war, which started in 2001, yeah, to 2016, it's estimated 453,300 Americans have died from opioid use. And most of them are related with this uh, oxycontin, which were which they produce in the same air in the same era. You know, it coincides. You know, so and because this oxycontin, you can just have it by uh, through a prescription from your doctor. It's all legal. You know, he probably also a Freemason. And um, this has opened the door to further drugs abuse, you know. And um, so there was a cheap opioid drug, you know, even paid by the um, uh, by the uh, by the medical insurance, you know. <laughs> So by the medical insurance, all these opioids, uh, these uh, oxycontin, you know, if you get a prescription from your doctor, it got all paid out of the um, what what other people pay taxes for, and this is a heavy burden upon the uh, financially upon the whole tax system and the the whole uh, economics of of an entire country. Can you imagine? I mean, these people, the um, the Sackler family, who owns um, the um, Purdue Oxycontin factories, they made fifty three billion dollars. You know, with your tax money. You know that that's another part of the story about which nobody even talks about. Yeah. Can you imagine 53 billion tax money just gone? And so half a million Americans died. And what are they, 70 years old or 80 years old people? No, they're, they're like teenagers, you know, hardly 20 years old. The whole youth, you know, half a million kids died 
because of these Freemason authorities and politicians and uh, and their base in the Alps, you know, the whole pharaonic elite, half a million kiddies died because of this. They just made it legal, you know. The, they made the, the opium trade uh, with the war in Afghanistan, they made it legal. And then selling it in the US and in uh, the whole world, they made it legal by, uh, you, know, you know, compress it into a pill, you know, the, op the opium, just compress it into a pill. Then it looks like a medicine, right? Can you believe it? A medicine. You know, it's just heroin, com com you know, compressed in a pill. That's what it is. You just have a visit to your doctor and you can get it. You know? And this is what happened. This is just big, big, huge crime, genocide, population control, Freemasonry, Pharaoh, Pharistocracy, Switzerland. The whole thing is, is in it, you know. They open up the whole, the whole range of all their weapons against us altogether. The US 2007, there were 42,800 OxyContin related emergency calls, which makes a simplified lesser number of 40,000 times 20 for the 23 years is roughly 800,000 and probably when you count 10 to 23 years at least 1 million emergency calls for oxycontin over 23 years and which is supposed to be a harmless painkiller as the producing company Purdue claimed and had perpetrated such an aggressive publicity for. So you see, you know, when there are one million emergency calls, there hasn't been any protection at all from the authorities because they're all in it, you see. So here it says, OxyContin, 1 million emergency calls in 23 years from 1995 to 2018. And this is probably even higher, you know. I mean, what's an emergency call? I mean, if you're in an emergency, most people, they can't even pick up the phone anymore and, and make a phone call. So this number is far much higher. And the authorities did nothing. They didn't do their work for which they're paid for. You know, they're just sucking up our t tax money. Then the indirectly related deaths because of oxycontin as it is a drug that has functioned to open the door to drugs addiction which in 2021 in the US 106,000 people dying because of a drugs OD which means a drugs overdose, simplifying 100,000 times 20 is 2 million potentially OxyContin related deaths over the 23 years of existence of OxyContin, which is premeditated mass murder. And of course, all in the name of population control, which has been proven so because the authority have done nothing to protect the population. They're all Freemasons, they're all pharaohs, it's the elite with their 
pharaonic bays in the Alps, and they wanted it. You know, they're all in it. So it's definitely population control. This is a genocide. I mean, two million. Oxycontin, it says, Oxycontin, two million deaths over 23 years. Yeah. It is population control. And this is the oxymoron. Or maybe just the evil ones behind the screens or behind the mask. And here comes the Knights Templar connection. Because apparently and statistically, the most Oxycontin related deaths happened in the US town of St. Bernard Parish in the state of Louisiana. And St. Bernard de Clairvaux was where the Knights Templars were founded in the middle of France next to the town of Troyes in that St. Bernard de Clairvaux Monastery of the Cistercian Order and where I have been filming for you a couple of years back. And Louisiana has been named after the French King Louis XIV, also called the Sun King, the longest ruling monarch in history who ruled for 72 years. So, as soon as I see a huge crime committed, and a whole chain of crimes being related to the Knights Templars, it goes click in my head. And I know this isn't a coincidence, but a perpetrated setup with an encoded message to the worldwide Freemason community on all key positions who derive out of the Knights Templars. You all remember my Mafia videos about Sicily, in which I explain that the Mafia comes out of the Knights Templars, who were the first multinationals in history for whom any business, moral or immoral, is okay, just as the Mafia are drug dealers. There's a legal mafia like authorities, doctors, pharmaceutical companies producing Oxycontin and whatnot, and Freemasons, and there is the illegal mafia. The Swiss Templar dogs in the middle are called Saint Bernard dogs, used for saving people in a snow avalanche as a reference to the fact that the Cistercian Order of St. Bernard, also called the Knights Templars, were saved from the French King through the escape into their safe haven, Switzerland. Therefore, the Templar name St. Bernard for the Swiss Saviour Dogs. You can see here Saint Bernard on the left hand side, his white Cistercian robe or cape. So it's no coincidence that Saint Bernard Parish became the epicenter of the Oxycontin pandemic. So here it says, uh, Satus Bernardus, it's all in Latin. And here you can see his white Cistercian robe with this hip hop uh, thing on it, you know, so you can hide under it. And here you see the monk with the two Saint Bernard dogs in the snow of Switzerland. And here's a Knights Templar. So here it says Oxycontin Drugs Mafia, Louisiana, St. Bernard, 
perish. It's all related, people. They don't do this for nothing. When you see these Templar names pop up, well, you should know what's really behind it because they always do this, people. So here in this thing called the National Drug Intelligence Center, Louisiana Drug Threat Assessment. Oh, this, this is in 2001. Yeah. So, but anyway, already in 2001, when uh, OxyContin has, had only been on the market for six years, uh, they already talk about it here. And I'll show that to you. Here's all the other drugs, all the other goodies. Yeah, OxyContin, the powerful opiate, op opiate painkiller OxyContin is being abused throughout Louisiana, but it's particularly pro problematic in Louisiana's southeast parishes in St. Bernard Parish. There you go. The abuse of OxyContin known on the street as killers. So they call OxyContin, you know, a prescription painkiller by your doctor. They call it the killers. There you go. Has become so acute that the drug now rivals cocaine in its influence on crime and violence. Police, pharmacists and substance abuse treatment centers in the area report that the problem is fueled in part by physicians who write prescriptions for the drug without performing proper screenings or examinations. So how come for the whole of Louisiana with big towns like New Orleans, they talk about St. Bernard Parish, eh? This little part. Hey, how come, eh? So, but, but they lie here. They, say they, they only talk, it said OxyContin, only five overdose deaths. Between October 2000 and January 2001. Okay, that might be correct though. I mean, that's only, what is it? That's only three months. In three months time, uh, 23. Three years ago, well, they already had five ODs in um, St. Bernard Paris. Okay, so that might be correct. And um, so, I mean, St. Bernard Paris, I mean, Knights Templars. So this is about St. Bernard Parish in Louisiana and Paroisse de Saint Bernard. So a parish is a religious community, eh? just like um, a, a monastery is a parish by the Knights Templars. And here it says uh, the name Saint Bernard. It comes from the patron saint of colonial governor Bernardo de Galvez, which is, of course, it's uh, nonsense, absolute nonsense. I mean, this is uh, Spanish, Bernardo de Galvez. Yeah, Spanish. And um, Louisiana was French. And there's only one saint. A governor is not a saint, you know. How can he be a saint? And uh, the only saint Bernard that exists is uh, Saint Bernard de Clairvaux, the um, the founder of the Knights Templars in his um, Cistercian monastery. And here's Louisiana. So apparently, this is where the whole where the epicenter of the um, of this uh, drug related uh, oxycontin uh, massacre where the epicenter is um, so there's only one saint in the whole of his saint bernard in the whole of history that is saint saint bernard de clairvaux not some Spanish governor. You know, they try to hide it, you know, everywhere. And of course, because nowadays, uh, there's only 35,000 persons living there. So 
five people OD'd because of OxyContin only in, in three months. So that's quite a lot, you know. And uh, Saint Bernard Parish in Louisiana. Uh, just before, a couple of times I called the uh, OxyContin um, murderous uh, campaign or a pandemic, which is maybe wrong, but um, um, they also call it an epidemic. And apparently it says an epidemic is the, um, is the lesser pandemic and not as widespread like over frontiers. And in both an epidemic, apparently, and a pandemic, it should be an infectious disease. So I really don't know how to call it, but um, uh, here it says uh, a disease or condition is not a pandemic. Uh, it must also be infectious. For instance, cancer, cancer is responsible for ma many deaths, but is not considered a pandemic because the disease is not con contagious. So I'm sorry about that. So it's neither a, um, the OxyContin th thing, it's neither a pandemic nor a epidemic. So, so maybe someone can help me how to call it. <laughs> I don't know. So I'm sorry about that. Nearby St. Bernard Parish, there is the Knights Templar Commandery of St. Bernard de Clairvaux in New Orleans. And there is the Grand Commandery of Knights Templars of Louisiana. So they are there. All right. Here you can see that. The Commandery of St. Ber Bernard de Clairvaux of New Orleans was organized in April 1996. You see, this coincides again with OxyContin, which, which started to be produced uh, in 1995. You know, th this is not a coincidence, people. And here it says, the pri Priory of Saint Bernard de Clairvaux the Sovereign Military Order of the Temple of Jerusalem. And look here, in that coat of arms, you've got the crescent moon. Just as I've shown you in that village, you know, where there's a Templar's cross in Pfaffenheim, in Alsace, where there is this, um, uh, the crescent moon together with the Templar's cross in the, in the coat of arms of the town, which you can even see at the, 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 the town council, you know, the crest. And this is because the Knights Templars, they had a, an alliance with the Muslims. They betrayed the European Crusaders. And here you see the red and white uh, checkerboard configuration of the Red House and the White House of Pharaoh, which are also the colors of the Knights Templars. And here it says, uh, Deus et Patria, God and the Fatherland. Yeah, sure, yeah. And uh, so here you can read the rest. And uh, well, I, I didn't even read it, you know, so. So there's a lot of members here. This one is a, a real aristocrat here. Comte Chevalier Laurent Longer de la Guéronnière. So, it would be interesting maybe to look it up. Um, probably from an ancient Templar family. And uh, so they are there, you know. From the same time as the Oxycontin got produced, the, uh, the Priory of Saint Bernard de Clairvaux, the Knights Templars, are there and it's all related i mean they're, they're the biggest crook in history the riches on the planet and the mafia came out of them the freemasons came out of the knights templars the italian mafia there's n i haven't seen any other place in the world as sicily where there's so many knights templar commanderies 
and um, uh, Richard Leinhardt, he was there for a year. Richard Coeur de Lyon, he couldn't even speak English. And this is where, you know, the, uh, the biggest mafia guy, um, uh, you know, his name um, comes from Lionheart. Uh, Corleone. I mean, I've, I've shown you that in the video. It's all related, people. It's not a coincidence that uh, the uh, San Bernard Parish, that it is really the epicenter of this, well, I don't say the word anymore, of this killer wave. Let's put it that way. A killer wave it was. And there even too, here's the other Knights Templar Commandery of um, uh, Louisiana. It's probably also in, uh, in New Orleans. Well, it doesn't say really. It says the Grand Commandery of Knights Templars of Louisiana. And uh, so I think, yeah. They, they call themselves Christian Masons. <laughs> it's not possible. <laughs> yeah. Dedicated to improving our community through fraternity, charity, ritual. Yeah, rituals, yeah, blood rituals. And the heritage of the temp of Templary. Yeah, well. A lot of Knights Templars in uh, Louisiana. It's all related to um, Saint Bernard Parish and the other commandery starting at the same time as Oxycontin started out. It's, it's all related. Then the name of the Oxycontin Youth Killer Company is Purdue, which sounds exactly as the French perdu when pronounced by an English speaking person. Purdue and perdu with an e instead of a u means lost, which is also a reflection towards the Knights Templars who were lost on Friday the 13th, 1307, when they got arrested all over France. Don't you think the name Purdue is not related? Because these people in their orders and lodges know what they're doing with everything related to codes and numbers. So here is the French perdu, it means lost. And here the name of the company Purdue. And so it has a U here instead of an E. But if you pronounce this in English, you get Purdue. Here it says the Purdue Pharma LP, OxyContin. And this is in its feminine form, perdu, with an E. If it would be masculine, it would only perdu without the E. If the word before this one is masculine. And because a fraternity in French, la fraternité, it's feminine, which is kind of weird that a fraternity, that a brotherhood in French, it is feminine. There is a reason for this. I could explain that to you here, but it then it, it would get too long. It has a reason because it's kind of weird that a brotherhood is feminine. I, and, um, and all the brotherhoods, they all come out of the Knights Templars. So Purdue and together with all the Knights Templars and, and San Bernard Parish, and I mean, everything is pointing towards the Knights Templars, who became the biggest mafia and the biggest drug dealers in the world, with two million dead people in America because of these dudes here. 
and they founded Switzerland in the Alps, which is the, the biggest criminal base in the entire world. So don't you think that this name Purdue is related? Anybody who speaks French, when they hear Purdue, they think of an English speaking person that pronounces the French word for lost. So it's not a coincidence. I'm, I mean, everything is pointing with the sword. It's all pointing towards the Knights Templars and Freemasons and Mafia. And, that what it, and that's what it is. Eh? Or if you take their poison pills, you'll be lost, as in perdu, pronounced perdu by an English speaker, just like the company's name, Purdue. Coincidence? No, not really. So here it says, lost in your mind, which you can see here, you know. And lost in your mind with pills by Purdue. And here it says, perdu in French which gets pronounced Purdue, exactly like this here. And just don't think they didn't know this, eh? because this is what they did. I mean, look at those people who are, who are, you know, the drug addicts, what is it, in Kensington, in the US, taking fentanyl. Aren't they lost? Purdue, Perdue, you know? They, they they even say it, you know, what, what they're going to do. They present it to us. They always do this, people. And now the family behind this premeditated mass murder or population control, as they call it. The Purdue Killer Company belongs to the Zeckler family who once anglified their German and Swiss German name by taking off the umlaut on the A, that is the two dots on the A, which makes an E sound from the A sound and not really needed in English because in English the name Sackler gets exactly pronounced the original German or Swiss German way with the two dots on it. So here you see a victim and here it says Zeckler. So this is the original version of the German or Swiss German name with the umlaut here on the A. So it says here Zeckler family and they are behind the Oxycontin. So Oxycontin is the uh, the name of the um, of the brand. Yeah. But the name of the product is actually Oxycodone. But there are several companies who make it under another name. So it says here Oxycodone addiction. I guess they're afraid of, you know, it's a very powerful dynasty, the Sackler dynasty. So they are afraid to use the name Oxycontin uh, in order not to get dragged and not to get sued in front of a um, in front of a judge. So by using the name Oxycodone, which was invented like uh, more than 100 years ago, you know, you're sort of quite on the safe side you know you know with the uh like the justice department uh considering that part yeah as many names do the name zekler describes an ancient medieval profession the zekler name comes from the german word zack S A C K, meaning a bag. So, Sackler, a person, a Sackler means a bag maker. 
and in this case, a body bag maker with at least 3 million body bags being made because of this Sackler family and their murderous products. So, quite appropriate, really. Sackler means the body bag maker. The Sackler family knew about the dangerosity of their OxyContin painkiller, or rather, patient killer. As OxyContin, as all opioids, makes dependent and creating drug addicts of millions of enslaved, addicted young Americans and people from elsewhere. And the Purdue Company and their secular body bag owners knew all about that that it made addicted. So here you see all these pill bottles, like a cemetery, like a military cemetery. And it says oxycodone. Again, the same reason for not using oxycontin, because that's a brand and oxycodone is just a product. I mean, um, oxycontin is also oxycodone but not all oxycodone is oxycontin, if you see what I mean. Here it says uh, John Smith, it should say John Doe. And um, American flag, here you see all the pills with the flower. So here it says Swiss, German or German, and the profession and the name Sackler, it means a bag maker, as in body bags. You see, it needed a whole lot of body bags for the Sackler Purdue killer product. But for the Sackler family, the temptation was too big to stop, thus earning $35 billion with their deadly OxyContin product. I wouldn't be surprised if family members of the Sackler bloodline are in the body bag industry as well, as they perfectly well knew what their killer product would lead to ultimately yes death but as the saying goes one man's death is another man's bread and so generally applicable here in the secular case so you see a dead woman with a lot of pills and you see the white house with a lot of body bags and here it says secular 35 billion dollars the body bag family so here's about the Sackler family so originally with two dots on the a because it's german or swiss german and i'll read it for you here the Sackler family is an american family who founded and owed the pharmaceutical companies Purdue Pharma and Mundy Pharma. Purdue Pharma and some members of the family have faced lawsuits regarding overprescription of addictive pharmaceutical drugs, including OxyContin. Purdue Pharma has been criticized for its role in the opioid epidemic in the United States. Oh, so here they use the word epidemic, so not so bad after all. They have been described as the most evil family in America and the worst drug dealers in history. And so here you can read some more about it. The Sackler family, 
the body bag makers. And here about the profession Sackler and Beutler. So I'm sorry, it's only in German, but I'll translate it for you. So here it says that a Beutler, because in German, ein, ein Beutel, or that here, ein Beutelmacher, Beutel, it also means a bag. And Sack, from the word Sackler, it also mean, means a bag. bag. So the difference is between the Beutler, they use fine leather. Here it says, finest leather. It's almost the same word, eh? And the uh, Sackler here, they use um, like thick leather, you know, which is the, the difference between a uh, ein fine Teschner and ein Teschner, okay. Uh, the, the, here, this is the, uh, the profession of Zeckler here, um, it, it, it gets first mentioned in the 8th, in the 8th um, century. So that's from 700 to 800. Now that's in the, um, during the Merovingian times. And, you know, they were making bags out of uh, animal skins. Here it says, tier, it means a animal. And it was later on being replaced by uh, linen, linen, uh, like uh, cotton. And later on, they started uh, making um, beinkleid, like um, trousers out of leather, you know, like the famous uh, Bavarian um, leather pants. So for that, because it's quite thick leather, it needed a sackler to do this. So because already in the 800, and it was Napoleon who started um, in, the, um, in the 18th century after the French Revolution of 1789, he started um, giving or ordering people all over Europe um, to have a uh, to have a surname. Before Napoleon, people didn't have a surname, so and because there were guys, you know, who were having this profession of a bag maker, they gave themselves the name of uh, Sackler. And that's where it comes from. So it means a bag maker, eh? a body bag maker in this case here. So this here is about Arthur Sackler. And it says he, well, he lived um, from 1913 to 1987. He was also a, um, he was one of the three patriarchs of the controversial Sackler family pharmaceutical dynasty so there are dynasty you know the moment i hear the word dynasty you know i think of um, nobility so this is definitely nobility because um, normal people even even if you don't if you get rich which you won't you won't be able to keep it, you know, that they're gonna take it away of you if you're not part of the nobility. As uh, Sackler's reputation has been tarnished due to his company Purdue Pharma central role in the opioid crisis. So, And here about the. F and there was something I wanted to show you. Um, I are here. Born in Brooklyn, and they are out of uh, the Jay Walker. Uh, they were Jay Walker grocers who came to New York from the Ukraine and Poland. So 
But I guess, you know, if they became a dynasty and they could keep the money and everything, their wealth, that they are part of the Jay Walker nobility. And if you're not part of any nobility, whether it's European nobility or Jay Walker nobility, you won't become a dynasty, you know, and you, you won't get that rich because they're going to take it off you. you know, using the... Um, the legal mafia like the authorities or the illegal mafia and they're going to take all you, you won't even get rich you know if you're not part of the nobility and i don't know how much these people how much these jaywalkers how much they have been mixed later on because um when they came to uh to brooklyn that's probably well, a long time ago you know so the Sackler body bag makers, the bag makers. So this is about the Purdue Pharmaceutical Industries. Purdue Pharma, formerly Purdue Frederick Company, is an American privately held pharmaceutical company founded, founded by John Purdue Gray. It was owned principality by members of the Sackler family as descendants of Mortimer and Raymond Sackler. In 2007, it paid out one of the largest fines ever uh, levied against a pharmaceutical firm for misleading the public about how addictive the drug OxyContin was compared to other pain medications. So we're going to look at their logo here. Uh, no, that doesn't work. Okay. So we see it's a circle here, and there's three quarter, uh, one quarter is missing. So that means there are three quarters left. So it says the concept of three, and altogether it's the concept of four. And then it looks like a, um, like a mirrored G to the other side, which is funny. And there is a horizontal red line. Well, actually, the red line should be vertical because the red house, they are the old world's order. And it is the, um, the horizontal rule is, the, uh, is, is actually white for the new world's order. But um, maybe they mean to say that the, um, that the old world's order, the old uh, nobility, that they are abiding by the rules of the Republic and the horizontal rule. And anyway, the, the three pharaonic colors are in it, red, white, and blue. And um, so here's some about the history. Purdue Pharma was founded by medical doctors John Purdue Gray in 1892. So... And then it changed, you know, when the when the settlers took it over. And later on, I'll show you where the settlers, where they ran to, you know. And if they would have been really, you know, jaywalkers, and not, you know, they would have gone to the JJ bays. I explain on Brighton uh, what the JJ bays is. So in these uh, last videos I made, because I have to find all coded words against the um, the censorship because i can't pronounce the name of the jaywalker base in the middle east so now you will know what i mean eh? the jj the jj uh, base one j is for jerusalem and the other j is for jaywalkers so i guess you get it and they didn't run to there no <laughs> they ran to Switzerland. Eh? So these are important things, you know, um, instead of just following the, the usual, usual rumors and, you know, because these things go quite deep, you know, and you won't understand it, you know, with a, um, if you stay shallow and don't go into the history and don't follow, um, follow the money trail, like for instance.
and the money trail will always lead into Switzerland. So this is an interesting article connecting the settlers, Afghanistan and addiction. As I as I've explained to you just before. And uh, here we see a lion, which is the symbol, one of the symbols of the nobility. And um, this is the East India Company. You know, and in those days, the East India Company, they were like what Davos and the World Economic Forum is today. Funny enough, the Swiss German word for to run is Sackler, which is written in the same manner as the Sackler name, like S A with two dots C K L E. And guess where they ran to? Yes. <laughs> They ran to Pharaoh's bays in the Alps, taking all their accumulated wealth with them as well, and put it in the Swiss banks. The settlers themselves went to Kstaat in Switzerland, where the super rich crooks live, like Roman Polanski and the settlers who had in 2016 an estimated net worth of 16 billion dollars being the 19th richest family in America well their money went into the Swiss Nazi banks well how is this possible why doesn't the all-powerful United States do anything against these crooks and protect the endangered youth of America? Well, <laughs> because they're all in it. And as I told you, Switzerland is neutral. Not for you and me. No, we, the slaves, would get prosecuted, arrested by the Swiss Nazi police, thrown into the slammer indefinitely and extradited to the US. No, Switzerland is only neutral and the global safe haven for the aristocracy bloodlines and their money and not at all for us this has been agreed upon from the very beginning in 1291 when Switzerland got founded by the knights templars to make it pharaoh's base in the alps where all pharaonic bloodlines can find shelter, no matter what their crimes. Plus the fact that the settlers are most likely Swiss, considering the name, the Swiss German verb settler, meaning to run, their immediate choice to run back to Switzerland as things turned bad when Americans started to wake up about their vicious crimes, killing murderers, millions of young Americans. So here we can see lovely, neutral, clean, innocent Switzerland with their flag. And here it says, the Swiss German Alemannic Sekler means to run fast, like the Sekler dynasty ran fast to Switzerland. So Alemannic is being spoken, it's a dialect in southern Germany, 
also a part of uh, northern Italy in, um, in France, in eastern France, in Alsace, and in Vorarlberg in western Austria. It's been spoken in the buffer zone all around Switzerland. But the most Alemannic, pure Alemannic, you can find in Switzerland, which is the typical Swiss German. And they have different words, like the words Zekle, which is also sometimes written with an E. But most Swiss Germans, they would write it like this, with an A with the two dots on it. And with an E, it's pronounced exactly the same way as the A with the two dots. Because the two dots make out of the A, a E sound an E sound. And um, so the A is uh, like in German, that would be A, and with the two dots on it, it's E, Sekle. Just like in English, that's why they could take the two dots away. Right? So this is where they run to. It's, it's in the word, it, they are the body makers, the body bag makers, the Seklers, um, the, there is a Nazi link, which I'm going to tell you later on. Um, this is the neutral, this is the global neutral base for the elites where they can hide all their money. It was a Knights nice Templar idea. So here you can see it. It's in German, but, um, I'll translate it for you. I mean, it's quite obvious. It's, it even says jogger, jogging, you know, here. Sekle. So you can write it with an E or with, mostly with the A uh, umlaut. And rennen, it means to run. You see, it's almost the same word. So Sekle, it means rennen, to run. Here it is. And here is Berndeutsch where I was, and um, I, sp I, I, I speak and understand Berndeutsch, Swiss German, and especially in Berndeutsch, what they speak in the capital, Bern, especially on the countryside where I was, they say Sekhle, you know, the C indicates is being pronounced like Sekhle, and it says here, Rennen, it means to run. Like the Sekhle family, they ran to Switzerland. I mean, is this a coincidence? No, it's not. And this is Alemannic here. It's also Sekle is Alemannisch. Alemannic, like Swiss German is Alemannic, and around Switzerland they speak Alemannic. There was a tribe, the Alemannic tribe. Like the word for German in French is still Allemand because of this. They call him the Alemannic because they were the first tribe that uh, collaborated with the Romans, the first German tribe, like the Saxons and, and the, the Angles, the Anglo-Saxons, Anglo they never, at least in Germany, they never collaborated with the Romans. In England, they did actually. So, um, uh, no, that was afterwards in England. The uh, Anglo-Saxons never collaborated with the, um, with the Romans. And uh, so there were a lot of Alemannic soldiers in the Roman army. This is where the already 2000 years ago, when they murdered the, um, the Gallic people all over France, which was the biggest genocide. So the Alemannic, uh, they are quite special. They always collaborated with the system, which we can still see today with the, I say that in Swiss German now. Um, Van der Sackler Familie auf der Schweiz Sackler Gang. It means that when the um, in Swiss in Berndeutsch, when the uh, the Sackler family when they uh, when they sackled or ran to Switzerland, I mean still collaborating with the Roman Empire, the Alemannic tribe. Now, again, once more, here it says in the internet, in Bern, the capital, they say Sekle for Rennen, to run, run back to Swaziland, Sekle family. And here it says, this is called the Alemannic uh, lexicon, 
or dictionary. It says here, schnell rennen, run. Uh, rennen, it means to run, and schnell, it means fast. In uh, Südbadisch, so that's southern Germany, they say Sekle. Now they say Sekle, without the ch. That's only the Swiss Germans who do this. And it says the Alemannic lexicon. And here they say, they, uh, they talk about Alsace or in Eastern France, as I told you, and Schweiz, in, that means Switzerland, and here it says Alemannic. They all say uh, to run fast, uh, Sekle. And in Switzerland, they pronounce it Sekle, like the Sekle family. So, as a proof for what I'm saying, so, so you believe it. So here it says, Sekle family accused of transferring money to Switzerland. And here you can see people in America, in Boston, they are protesting here. There it says, Predators, Sekle family, Dollar Oxycontin, Purdue Pharma, it's like a wolf in uh, sheep clothes. And um, well, you can find that there are more articles about it, but uh, I can't show them all to you. So people are waking up, but I mean, the government, the authorities are not doing anything, you know, against it. And here's some more of the article here. Uh, let you read it yourself. Here they talk about one billion dollars. Um, um, here the family that owns OxyContin, maker Purdue Pharma, used Swiss and other hidden accounts to transfer one billion to themselves. New York's Attorney General contends in court papers filed on Friday. So this is from 2019. Yeah. They don't talk enough about this. So I'll let you read it yourself here. Why? Because the authorities, the newspapers, they're all in it, you know, and they only talk about this low intensity war in the Ukraine, you know. So here it says in blue, they point to 20 million shifted from a Purdue parent company to Sekla, who then redirected substantial amounts to shell companies that own family homes in Manhattan and the Hamptons, another 64 million in transfers to Sekla came from a previously unknown family trust using a Swiss account, prosecutors said in their filing. Well, this is only the tip of the iceberg. This is, so you read it yourself and uh, yeah, they talk about billions of dollars going to Switzerland. Uh, the Sacklers, here it says, the, the Sacklers had an estimated net worth of 13 billion as of 2016, making them America's 19th richest family, according to Forbes magazine. This is what I told you just before. This is big, big crime, and they're all in it. US government is in it, the Swiss, the banks, the newspapers. The military, the CIA, the FBI, they're all in it. Because the key positions, they're all occupied by the Octogon from the motherland in the Alps. And uh, they have a lot of children, you know. So they all need a nice Mercedes car, some a chunk of land with a nice villa on it, you know. Of course, these people, they don't work, you know. This is Pharaoh's nobility. The aristocracy, they don't work. They never did. They parasite on us, you know, but they are organized and they got the, uh, the good ideas, you know, so the people are not organized. They, they cannot organize among themselves, you know, so this is why we got the whole situation here. So it's all going to Switzerland, eh? always, because it's their neutral base for them only and not for you. As this American um, comic, as he said, it's a big club, club, and you ain't in it. So here it says in uh, in German, 
and this is from 2020 so that was during pharaoh's um pharaoh's bug war against us so this is why hardly anybody talked about it well one of the reasons and maybe it's also the reason that at the cert at that very moment pharaoh inserted that uh, global bug uh, to us you know everywhere to attack us so we don't talk about this anymore but this is big this is huge and uh, here it says the family it's in german so opioid morgen siedeln in die schweiz über die familie sackler zieht nach stadt so the opioid um, moguls they move over to switzerland they moved into switzerland and the sackler family they moved to stadt you know here it says again stadt in stadt we have um, all the rich crooks you know like uh, Roman Polanski, the child rapist, and oh, the very rich people like the uh, like the uh, the Egyptian father of the uh, of the boyfriend of Lady Diana. I forgot his name. Um, Al Fayed, I think. Yeah, Al Fayed. Um, it's it's full of these super rich people, eh? So here it says here. Oxycontin. Uh, it says secular pain. Yeah, they give us a lot of pain, eh? Especially the parents of all the dead kiddies, all the body bags, eh? So, and there are two reasons, you know. You now we got the Ukraine war attraction, and there was the uh, Pharaoh's bug war distraction. Uh, so nobody talks about this and this is really a, a huge scandal it says the purdue farmer the lost farmer if you take these pills you're lost you're hooked on it and you're gonna die you're gonna be mixed up you're gonna be lost in your head just lost in your own head looking for yourself you know ending up in the streets like like in kensington not anymore knowing what you do just looking for yourself where, where am i where's my soul or where's my where am i you know what am i doing here this is what they do it's it's devilish it says dead what is it what does it say how many dead well there are millions of dead and this is 2018 you know the media hardly talk about it. So here again, it says uh, the the New York Post is writing about it, and uh, that the the Sackler family went to Stad and how they're happy to receive friends there. And in Stad here, they immobilian that means real estate, so they own a lot of real estate already there. Uh, they're probably neighbors, you know, next door neighbors with uh, Roman Polanski. So like in the morning, like, hey, Roman, how are you? Oh, isn't Switzerland great? Oh, man, they helped us out. You know, those Americans, you know, we're so happy to left those Americans. Why well, we raped their children, you know, and we killed them by the millions. But, uh, you know, it's nice to be back in Switzerland, eh? So you won't read this here, like in American newspapers, that they went to Kstad in Switzerland, right? and how, how they're so happy there, you know. And this was from 2020 here, yeah? and they already talk about 400,000 dead because of OxyContin, yeah. But yeah, well, then again, they, uh, we had other distractions and other things uh, you know like pharaoh's bug war and all that so they went to kstadt yeah kstadt where jacqueline and mortimer exactly are they call her she calls herself the the mother theresa of stad the menuhin festival 
there's Jacqueline Sackler, you know. Now, all these, you know, they're all Freemasons and, and philanthropists, you know, aren't they nice people, eh? It's like all these people having all these saints in history, like Saint Saint Bernard, he was a butcher. Saint Saint Bernard de Clairvaux of the Knights Templars, like in Saint Bernard Parish. You know, they these people are butchers. No saints at all. It's the same as as Obama having the uh, the Nobel Prize or Yasser Arafat or whatever kind of terrorists, you know. And this one is they call her the Mother Theresa. Wow. Well, it's, it's their newspapers in the first place, you know, who, who give all these names, eh? And um, yeah, they, she has a, uh, the Tate Gallery in London, the Guggenheim Museum in New York, the Louvre in Paris. They all got a lot of money from them. And um, I will show you why. I'll show you why. It is an irrefutable historical fact that OxyContin, under the original name of OxyCodon, was used by the Nazis in 1939 in a false flag operation which triggered World War II when they overdosed some Dachau concentration camp inmates with OxyContin during the Gleiwitz incident. And even Adolf Hitler also took OxyContin, as his doctor, Theodor Morel, said oxycontin in fact was invented in 1916 by two jaywalkers of whom one got murdered by the nazis in 1942 and from then on oxycontin became a nazi drug in the hands of the Nazis. So here it says Oxycontin and World War II Nazis 1939 Gleiwitz. So here you can see the radio tower, here it says, of Gleiwitz next to the Polish border, right? which was a false flag operation. The prisoners from Dachau, they were dressed in Polish uniforms, and you can see them here. And they were OD'd with this here, OxyContin. So this stuff here, this Nazi drug, has a long history. Eh? And then after this, the German invasion started a false flag operation, saying the Poles attacked the um, Germany because the Dachau concentration camp inmates, you can see them lying here from in those days, there were no jaywalkers here. They were all Germans, you know. A lot of left-wingers and communists just killed them. Put them in Polish uniforms. And then um, the, um, the invincible SS, they shot them to pieces. And the next day they said, okay, you know, this guy here, Mr. the Swiss sleeper agent, Mr. Hitler, he said, Ab heute wird zurückgeschossen! He said, from now on, we'll shoot back. Oh, there we go. You know, the Nazis, they were a bunch of liars. Huh? The whole thing is a lie. Nazi Templars, they're all liars. And the whole of this, their base in the Alps, it's all based upon lies and lies and lies and lies and lies. <laughs> Which is the first weapon of Pharaoh. It's the first weapon of Pharaoh's aristocracy. You know, and we we are so stupid and believe their lies, their endless lies. Hey, Swizzy. After that, and the Gleivitz false flag incident, OxyContin was in the hands of the Nazis. 
and culminating into this most recent, recent OxyContin Nazi drug mass murder by a family with a Swiss German or German name. And as usual, all traces leading to Switzerland, where the money trail ends, just as it happens and happened after any mass murder and mass genocide, after which the money trail leads back to Switzerland and ends in Switzerland. So here we can see Naujox. I'll tell you more about this bloke here who was behind the, um, the Gleiwitz false flag operation or the Gleiwitz incident. And here it says OxyContin, Nazi drug. They just stole it, you know, until this very day. And the deception that led to nearly 100 million deaths. Um, this is probably the same guy, Naujox. And uh, here you can see the, um, the Gleiwitz uh, Eiffel Tower. And it's all related. You know, the Nazis won the war and Switzerland is their base. So I show you about the Gleiwitz incident here on the Oxycodon um, website. And it has very here again, it has various brand names such as Roxycodon, Oxycontin, etc. So the name of this of the the product is uh, Oxycodone. But as every time there's a new over the last well more than hundred years, there's a new company that brings this on the market every time they give it a new name. Maybe they give the pills a new form, a new color, whatever. And here are the roots of administration here by mouth, sublingual, intramuscular, intravenous, intranasal, subcutaneous, transdermal, rectal, epidural, etc. Well, it's really a nice candy for the average drug addict who understands each of these, um, each and single of these uh, words here, like intramuscular, intravenous, who are, that are like, for us, they're like alien words, but they are like um, daily language for the, uh, the average drug, uh, drugs addicts. So you can read it yourself, punch, pause. And um, what I wanted to show you here is about the history. You know. um, yeah, during Operation Himmler, uh, Skofedal, it's another name of it, was also reportedly injected in massive overdose into the prisoners dressed in Polish army uniforms in the staged incident on September the 1st, 1939, which opened the Second World War. So I'll show you the, um, and there's a lot more to read here, but I'm, I'm not going to show you everything. Yeah? Operation uh, Himmler, um, also Operation Conserva, that's a, a can, you know, with food, conserva, I don't know why, consisted of a group of 1939 false flag undertakings planned by Nazi Germany to give the appearance of Polish aggression against Germany. The Germans then used propaganda reports of the events to justify the invasion of Poland, which started well, World, War, World War II. And here, uh, you can read here, the personal notes of Adolf Hitler's physician, Theodor Morel. There, there he is. Never had any problems after the war. Indicate Hitler received repeated injections of oikodal, oxycodone, and scofedal, 
as well as dolantin, uh, pethidine, codeine, and morphine less frequently. Oxycodone could not be obtained after late January 1945. Ah, interesting. Well, it, uh, they should say oxycodone could not be obtained in Germany after late January of 1945. Why? Well, because it all went into the United States. You know, the painkiller. This is also part of Operation Paperclip. Operation pa Paperclip uh, that it, it talks not only about the people, you know, the academics and the scientists going to the US, but also their inventions and the Nazi inventions they stole from other people, like these two jaywalker inventors of the uh, oxycodone in 1916. And um, um, it says somewhere, uh, that it was invented uh, by those two uh, jaywalkers. And uh, yeah, so here are the um, Martin Freund and Jacob Edmund Speyer of University of Frankfurt in Germany published the first uh, uh, synthesis of oxycodone from Thebane in 1916. When Freund, that means a friend, died in 1920, Speyer wrote his obituary for the German Chemical Society. Speyer, born to a jaywalker family in Frankfurt am Main, just like the Rothschild, in 1878, became a victim of the, um, I can't pronounce the word, the word, I had a code for it, but I can't remember it now. Um, he died on May 5th, 1942, the second day of the deportations from Lodz ghetto. His death was noted into the ghetto's chronicle. And together with all the jaywalker belongings and uh, their money and their, their Swiss bank accounts, Everything became property of the Nazis. I mean, the guy's dead, eh? So, uh, you, you, so they just took it. And um, yeah, so it became a Nazi drug, which is which is obvious, eh? So the jaywalkers had no more control over it. You know, it became a Nazi drug. They didn't even have control over their own lives. You know, so. So, um, let's forget their money or their, their belongings, their inventions, you know, not even their own lives they could control anymore. And they, they wiped them out. And it became a Nazi drug. And then oh, I'll tell you the rest. So here is the Gleiwitz incident, and it's related to OxyContin. Can you believe it? So the Gleiwitz incident. Überfall auf den Sender Gleiwitz. Here is in Polish, Provokacja Gleiwitzka. I hope I pronounced that right. Eh? Uh, so the Gleiwitz incident was a false flag attack on the radio station uh, Zenda Gleiwitz in Gleiwitz, like Auschwitz, Gleiwitz, you know. Witz in German, it means a joke. So there are a lot, a lot of jokes going on, eh? Nazi jokes. I mean, it's a bit difficult to understand it. I suppose the Swiss understand them very well, the Nazi jokes. Then Germany and now Gliwice in Poland staged by Nazi Germany on the night of August 31st, 1939, along, along with some two dozen similar incidents. The attack was manufactured by German, Germany as a casus belli, a reason for the war to justify the invasion of Poland, well, etc., etc. <clears throat> so here the, there's the, uh, the Eiffel Tower of the Gleiwitz uh, broadcast. You can read, you can read the, uh, the rest uh, yourself. 
And oh yeah, here's the guy, Alfred. No, much of that is known about the Gleiwitz incident comes from the affidavit of SS Sturmbadenführer Alfred Naujox. At the Nuremberg trials, in his testimony, he stated that he organized the incident under orders from Reinhard Heydrich and Heinrich Müller, chief of the Gestapo. On the night of um, August 31st, a small group of German op operatives dressed in Polish uniforms and led by Naujok seized the Gleiwitz station and broadcast a short anti-German message in, Pol um, in Polish. The operation was named Großmutter gestorben. The grandmother died. Oh, that's weird, eh? The operation was to make the attack and the broadcast look like the work of Polish anti-German saboteurs. The operation was planned and carried out from the Slavietschitz Palace. Ah, oh, palace. Okay, they're, oh, of course they're in a palace. Yeah, it's always by the nobility. Oh, a huge palace. That's interesting. Eh? That's an interesting palace. I wonder if it has some links to the Knights Templars. Well, anyway, here is Gleiwitz. Germany was like twice as big in those days. They shouldn't have done World War II, you know. They, they, uh, they, they could have kept a, a huge chunk of their country. So, and um, this is interesting here. Oskar Schindler, you know, the guy from Schindler's List, who's credited with later saving the lives of 1,200 jaywalkers during the <laughs> played, oh yeah, the, um, what was the name again for the uh, H word, the, um, uh, the hole catch. Yeah, they, they caught him uh, in, a, in a hole, the hole catch, because it also starts with an H. That was my code word played a role in, because if I pronounce this word here, and this one here, they take my video off by the machines who recognize it, and uh, then I'm being treated as a Nazi. And uh, yeah, so Oskar Schindler played a role in supplying the Polish uniforms and weapons used in the operation as an agent for the Abwehr. Oh. Nice. So Steven Spielberg, he didn't tell the whole story eh, about Oskar Schindler. Oh, there's betrayal, betrayal, betrayal. You know, everything is a lie. I mean, and I fear that, uh, you know, Steven Spielberg, I mean, very rich Hollywood. He's not a normal jaywalker, you know, this, this is typically jaywalker nobility. And um, as well as probably Oskar Schindler, maybe his name is Von Schindler, you know. You know they're all fairy tale tellers, you know. But it was a good film, I mean, very good film. There's, I mean, uh, there's truth in it, I mean, maybe and most likely to uh, to save himself oscar schindler he uh, he saved uh, a couple of jaywalkers here 1200 i mean these things happen and uh, apparently a lot of nazis and uh, even israeli people have told me this they went after the war they went to the jj base right Even the jaywalkers themselves, they told me this. Eh? At the moment, nobody, a lot of people, jaywalkers in the JJ base, they don't trust their government anymore and they know it's a Nazi government. Of course, you know, what do you think in 1948? Do you really think that, you know, the, the British Empire just gave Palestine to the jaywalkers, you know? Mm. Who came out of the um, the whole catch like uh, three hundred guys with pocket knives who 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 fought against seven Arab armies like and then even one. Anybody believes the whole fairy tale? Hey, eh? that the British Empire that just 
gave the, the, the Palestine just away to those jaywalkers without keeping the control over it through the whole system of Freemasonry and, and Swiss banks and, and Islamofascism by um, François Genou and uh, the uncle of Yassir Arafat, Yassir uh, uh, al uh, um, Oh, I forgot. I forgot his name. Um, the Mufti of Jerusalem. Hey, you really believe this? That they just gave it to? No, no. Yeah, you know, we're being we're being lied to, and also the jaywalkers are being lied to. We're all being lied to. Uh, so Oscar Schindler, he did a couple of other things, eh? Which are not really in the film, you know. Why make a four-hour video, you know, and don't say this, you know? I mean, what's what's the what's the you what's the intention of it all? We have to question everything nowadays. Of course, the name of the um, the Mufti of Jerusalem was uh, Amin Al Husseini, who was the uncle of Yasser Arafat. They're all bloodlines; they're all dynasties. Eh? Um, so here's the guy who triggered World War II with OxyContin. Alfred Naujox. So I'll let you read it yourself. Um, he was a Hauptsturmführer. And um, uh, this is interesting here about his later life here. Look. I'll read it for you. This is really shocking. At the Nuremberg trials, Naujox declared the attack against the Gleiwitz radio tower was under orders from Heinrich Müller, the head of Gestapo, and his superior, Reinhard Heydrich. After the war, he was not considered high-ranking enough to stand trial, but was called as a mere witness at the Nuremberg trials. Okay, here we got the guy who triggered World War II with 100 million deaths through OxyContin in a, a, a false flag attack. And he's considered not high ranking enough at the Nuremberg trials. Oh, come on. And in 1947, Now Yorks was extradited to Denmark to stay in trial. There he was found guilty of his role in the murder murders of Danish resistance fighters, oh, that as well, on top of that, and sentenced to 15 years in prison. However, in 1950, now York's sentence was reduced to four years, resulting in his immediate release in 1950. Following the trials, now York worked as a businessman in Hamburg, where he eventually sold his story to the media as the man who started the war. He's even proud of it, people. Look at that. He only went, he, he didn't go a day in, into prison for starting World War II and then even write a book about it, you know? The man who started the war, the man from Angola, what? He only went to, to prison for four, for four years because he killed some Danish people, you know? but not for starting World War II. He was alleged to have been involved in running Odessa. Oh, that as well. You know, Odessa, it's a harbor city in the Ukraine. I told you that, which is part of the, uh, the ethnic Swiss that went to live in the Ukraine in the, uh, what was it, the 18th century. Yeah. And so that's why they, they took the same road you know, through the Swiss mountains and Austria and uh, Czechoslovakia, or was it only Slovakia, Romania? Uh, the same road as the Knights Templars and the Swiss took like hundreds or maybe thousand years ago, the Knights Templars in this case. So the Nazis and the Nazi Templars, as they were, they took the same road as their predecessors, the, Na the Templars did. Um, like a um, thousand years before that, um, going and settle and uh, make, uh, construct uh, Templar commanderies in the Ukraine, as I already told you. So this is how the Odessa 
the red line into the South America went to the town of Odessa. In Odessa, it means uh, Organisation der ehemalige SS Angehörigen. Together with Otto Skorzeny, who never had any problems either after the war, who handled contracts with the Spanish government, supplying passports and arranging for funds. And now York's NS associates handled former Nazi war criminals uh, going to Latin America, being responsible for their reception and protection there. Now York's died of a heart attack in Hamburg on April the 4th. 1966, age 54. You don't die naturally of a heart attack at 54, eh? So uh, my guess is the guy, you know, it got too hot. Um, like maybe the magazine, the Spiegel, wanted some answers and he just had to disappear. So they just declared him death. He disappeared as he already was in the, in the business of passports and arranging funds. It just started a new life somewhere. Right? That's, that's what they always do. Right? So we're being tricked, we're being lied, and the whole of history is a lie. And uh, the actual Oxycontin genocide is another Nazi genocide and connected to the Nazi Templars in their base in Switzerland and the Operation Paperclip. What better proof for the Operation Paperclip into the US and the Nazis winning World War II by observing OxyContin being the pharmaceutical agent leading to World War II with 100 million deaths. And now, 80 years later, from 1939 to nine, uh, 2019, again, the same Nazi drug OxyContin or OxyCodin being used for a genuine genocide on millions of Americans with just as after World War II, the crime, money, and the perpetrators going to Switzerland, their Nazi Templar base in the Alps. It's just business as usual. So here it says Operation Paperclip eventually led to OxyContin Nazi drug genocide. So with Operation Paperclip, not only the Nazi war criminals, you know, went to the Americas, but also their inventions and their know-how and their science, you know, like Werner von Braun, making the NASA and everything. And again, oxycodone is the, is the product name and oxycontin is the brand name. But oxycontin is, is in fact the Nazi drug, oxycodone. In spite of the fact that in 1916 it was invented by two jaywalkers, but the Nazis stole everything from the jaywalkers their lives included. So they are not to be blamed for this drug. If you see that oxycontin or oxycodone was invented by the jaywalkers, they have nothing to do with that. This genocide and the, this, what they did with this Nazi drug, because the Nazis stole everything of the jaywalkers and oxycontin became a Nazi drug, and now doing just another genocide. Americans, why do you need to save Ukraine and Russia when you can't even save yourselves and your children from these octagon Nazis on all key positions in your own country? Why? 
It says, here's the genocide with oxycodone or oxycontin. Oper and I read it for you. Operation Paperclip got the Nazi drug oxycodone into the US of A. Do you understand this? So act now. I just want to get back quickly to the Gleiwitz incident to explain something uh, which you shouldn't forget actually, what I already explained. So um, here in an oral testimony at the trials, Erwin von Lahausen, an aristocrat or pharaoh's fair aristocracy, stated that his division of the Abwehr, the Abwehr, that's the counterintelligence, was one, it's like FBI or the, the MI5. Um, the Abwehr was one of two that were given the task of providing Polish army uniforms, equipment, uh, equipment and identification cards. He was later told by Wilhelm Canaris, that was the head of the Abwehr, a admiral, that people from concentration camps had been disguised in these uniforms in order, and ordered to attack the radio station. Now, who is Erwin von Lahausen? What are all these aristocrats doing among the Nazis? Eh? So let's have a look. Okay, there he is. So General Major Erwin Heinrich René Lahausen von Vivremont Wow, that's a mouthful, eh? Vivremont, that's French, because that's where the whole nobility actually comes from. After they were in uh, Rome, and uh, before that they were in ancient Egypt. He was a high-ranking Abwehr official during the Second World War, as well as a member of the German resistance, and a key player in attempts to assassinate Adolf Hitler on March 13th, 1943, and well, the famous uh, July 20th, 1944, with uh, uh, Klaus von Stauffenberg. So, what I wanted to tell you, so how come all of a sudden, so a, a, this was a Nazi, and because he, he, he planned to assassinate Adolf Hitler, all of a sudden, they became all heroes in Germany and in the whole world. So how come they just change like this, you know? So here's the other one, Klaus von Stauffenberg, the famous one. Yeah. How come all these aristocrats, aristocrats, first they were with the Nazis, and then all of a sudden when the war was almost over, they were against the Nazis. It has been um, falsely presented in history that they saw Germany um, be demolished because of the Nazis and all of a sudden, you know, they became the good guys, you know. But no, 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 this is false. Which I explain in my film, The Nobility World Wars, on my channel, Gue. And here another one, Fab Fabian von Schlabrendorf, all aristocrats. The real reason is, as I explained to you, there were three parties, not only the good ones and the bad ones, the Nazis and the Allies, no. There was Switzerland, there was um, the aristocrat, uh, German aristocracy, and there was um, England and America, and let's say just the, um, the Order of the Garter if you want to understand it. And the Order of the Garter stands for England and America and the Allies, yeah. So it's still the same old war, you know. All the aristocrats in Germany, like this Klaus von Stauffenberg and this bloke here, the Erwin Lahauser general, you know, they wanted to have the, uh, the German emperor back at, on the throne, you know, the emperor um, Wilhelm II. 
And they thought they could use Adolf Hitler, who, to, who lied to them, you know, in order to get every, everybody, like, uh, in favor of uh, Nazism. And then um, when all these aristocrats, when they um, discovered, you know, Hitler was betraying them, actually, um, because as I told you, they are the Nazi Templars, right? And the Nazi Templars, they are the horizontal, horizontal um, democratic uh, horizontal rule of the um, of the of the Republic, whereas all the uh, all the aristocrats they are for the feudal vertical rule. So this is the ancient war, you know. So Hitler, he got betrayed. Uh, Hitler betrayed them. And when it was too late, at the end of the war, they tried to, to kill Hitler. You know, so, which is not really uh, a reason, you know, to present them as heroes all of a sudden. You know, they were just thinking of themselves and of their own, you know. So, and this is where we get to the point, actually, where Adolf Hitler, he betrayed the Germans. Um, as he was actually working for the Order of the Garter as well, and the, Knight Tem the Knights Templar system or, uh, of the Swiss na of the Swiss Octagon, he was also a, a Hitler was also in this case a British agent, and this is the reason why uh, um, Rudolf Hess, the second man in the empire. He he flew to um, what was it in 1941, I think. He flew to um, to Lord Hamilton in Scotland, another aristocrat with a castle and all that, um, in order to resolve uh, to stop the war, you know, because Rudolf Hess, and, the, and that's why we he after the war, the rest of his life, they kept Rudolf Hess in the dark, you know, he was not allowed to express himself. Because that would, you know, that would open the whole box, you know, the whole, the whole conspiracy, you know. So actually, Octagon, Switzerland, and their agent, uh, sleeper agent Hitler, worked together, actually. Um, they were part of the Order of the Garter. Um, for the um, in in which actually a monarchy becomes a constitutional monarchy, and accepts the constitution of the Knights Templars, the Parliament, and the horizontal rule. And the German aristocracy did not want this, and they didn't want either all the uh, the immigrants from uh, from Africa and the Muslim countries, you know, to uh, to come into Germany. And that's why, actually, it's quite complex, you know. So and you must understand this, you know. And this, so this guy, he was also involved into the Gleiwitz uh, incident. And this is why, actually, uh, Hitler and the Nazis, they had the British and the expeditionary expedition expeditionary force escape at Dunkirk whereas with the Stukas and everything they, they could have they could have killed them all I think it was a million men but it was not the aim that uh, um, Britain would and the, and the royal house and the order of the garter would lose the war it was not the aim at all and this is why uh, Hitler let the um, the expeditionary force escape at Dunkirk. Uh, as I told you, there are three parties, three part parties, and the best to see it this way: there is the Order of the Garter, which is a mixture of the horizontal. It's a compromise between the horizontal and the vertical rule. Then there is the vertical rule. In this case of the Second World War, it was the uh, the German aristocracy, and then there was the horizontal rule, uh, the Nazi Templars. So these three parties: horizontal, vertical, and a compromise, which is the Order of the Garter. So here, 
in this uh, Now Yorks um, uh, website here. Later on November the 9th, uh, 1939, Now Jocks, along with Walter Schellenberg. Hey, where did we hear this name um, just recently? Okay. Bing, bing. Where did we hear this? He participated in the Venlo incident which saw the capture in the Netherlands of two British SIS agents. Well, the SIS didn't exi exist in these days. It was the SOE, the uh, Special Operations Executive. So there was Captain Sigismund Payne Best and Major Richard Henry Stevens. And for this, he was personally awarded the Iron Cross by Hitler. They probably killed him, it doesn't say here. So, Walter Schellenberg. Now, let's have a look who is this guy here. Okay, there he is. Walter, Walter Schellenberg. And the name Schellenberg, so he was an SS Oberführer. I don't think that, that existed, it was Obergruppenführer. An uh, Obergruppenführer, actually, that's a, uh, a general. And he was also in the, um, in the Abwehr, the foreign intelligence and all these sort of things. Uh. So it doesn't say here, but Schellenberg or Schallenberg, it's also nobility. And where did we hear this recently with another one? of their operations against humanity you know uh, connected to the bug war of pharaoh oh yes there he is you remember him and alexander schallenberg he has a real coat of arms so he um it says a member of the branch of the Austro-Hungarian Schallenberg aristocratic family and Schallenberg was born in 1969 in Bern, Switzerland yeah where his father Wolfgang was Austrian ambassador uh, to Switzerland his mother is a native of Switzerland and the daughter of a Swiss banker <laughs> and president of UBS Alfred Sheva Oh, Schallenberg was raised in India. Oh, he was all over. You know, this is typical nobility. And you see, he has a coat of arms, which I explained to you with the three things here for the uh, the three uh, helmets for the uh, the concept of three. And you remember, there he is with his blue tie for the war with all the sheep on it, right? the sheeple. So it means that they are they are waging a war against us, the sheeple. Yeah. I mean, I mean, this guy was the chancellor, which is the president of Austria, a Swiss guy being the chancellor of Austria, and he um, ordered all the Austrians on uh, February the first, uh, two thousand and twenty-two to get pharaoh's poison into their veins because of the bug war and so a swiss guy ordered all the austrians so i can you imagine so maybe it also says here somewhere i think it did uh, so you see he was the uh, the chancellor uh, here in november 2021 schallenberg announced that uh, Pharaoh's um, um, a bug war poison would be mandatory in Austria from February 2022. It became the first European country to mandate this vaccine. And this was because of um, uh, Clemens, the guy who wrote all the books, the, uh, the, uh, the doctor in biology, uh, who got murdered this year. And uh, so it's all the same family. It's all the same bloodlines. It's it's uh, it's always the Nazis with their drugs and their genocides. Now it's OxyContin. Then they murdered the Jaywalkers. 
then they come with a bug war, now it's the Ukraine war, and Oxycontin or Oxycodone is a, um, is a Nazi drug. They stole it from the jaywalkers. It's a Nazi drug and they use it for, for, their, for their charming little genocides on humanity because of the population control. The Sackler dynasty are so powerful that they even have a Sackler wing in New York's famous Metropolitan Museum. So here it says the Sackler wing with one Sackler here, one Sackler there, one Sackler here, the MD, MD. Here, Purdue Pharma Oxycontin. And what do they show in the Metropolitan's Sackler wing? <laughs> Pharaohs being, of course, another indication for this powerful Sackler dynasty being part of the pharistocracy, Pharaoh's worldwide nobility showing the artifacts of the ancestors. So here it says, the secular wing with all these pharaonic temple here, with pharaonic statues. And here it says, secular gallery for Egyptian art, with another Egyptian artifact here. And here I wrote in it, secular pharistocracy. What more do you want? for proofs here. Yeah? This is far more than just an indication, right? And as if it wouldn't be enough for these pharaohs and eternal genociders of humanity, everywhere around the world where there are pyramids and museums with pharaonic artifacts, there is a secular wing, like here at the Louvre Museum in Paris, and where Pharaoh Macronos II celebrated his presidential election in 2017 in front of the big Louvre pyramid, which represent the Cheops pyramid of their ancestors in ancient Egypt, with three little pyramids around it, of which one of them officially is the Pyramid of Mikrinos, also called Macronos. So here you can see the big Louvre pyramid, you can see how small the people are in comparison. And there are three pyramids around it. Here's one, and here in the corner is one, and there's one here. And one of these is officially called the Pyramid of Mikrinos. Just as there is a, a one in uh, Egypt, next to the big pyramid of Cheops. So th the little one, probably this one here maybe, is a rep representation of the, the small Mikrinos pyramid after Pharaoh Mikrinos of, um, of ancient Egypt. And um, Pharaoh Macronos II of France, he was celebrating in one of these corners, probably here on this side, uh, in front of the Louvre pyramid, which represent the pyramid of Cheops. And somebody has counted it once, and all these glass parts, there are 666 apparently. I haven't counted it, but um, okay. And here it says, take down the secular name, because the secular name everywhere where there are pharaonic artifacts in the world, in museums, there is a secular wing. And these are probably Frenchies uh, who have taken up contact with the Americans and who put this here and take a nice picture and a video. Take down the Sackler name. 
So this is slightly more than just a indi an indication that this the settlers they are real pharaohs. It's the pharaohistocracy, and therefore it says here pharaohistocracy in these nice letters, settler, written in the original German way with the umlaut, you know, with their base Switzerland, which I told you it's the base of pharaoh, with which they terrorize the world and through which they conquered uh, Europe and the white race. And here we got Elizabeth Sackler of the Sackler dynasty, who has an entire floor in the Brooklyn Museum of New York, specially made for feminist art. And what do feminists say? Yes. They want to kill the patriarchy, which they say openly. <laughs> well, they certainly saw to that with their OxyContin drugs and killing a huge chunk of the patriarchy as well. And look at this so called feminist art with this Auschwitz triangle of death which I filmed a few years back at a war memorial in France. It's called here, this one here, it's called the dinner party because these freaks feed on us with their inverse triangles of death and whatnot. Now here it says Brooklyn Museum, the Elizabeth Sackler Center for Feminist Art. Oh, isn't it charming? You know, we all know their, their sort of art, you know, they're always like transmitting messages, all these, all these art stuff, what I've been filming for you on roundabouts and, you know, and everywhere in towns and all this. And this thing here, I mean, what are they eating? It looks like organs here. Here's the all seeing eye, another triangle here. And just look carefully at this cornerstone here, together with the rest. This is exactly what I filmed at that war me memorial, you know, where there were graves, um, you know, of people who were sent to the concentration camps, um, French resistance fighters, most of it. And they had exactly the same thing. So don't you think there is a connection? Yeah, look at this cornerstone. I'll show it to you. And here you can read some more about it. The Elizabeth Sackler Center for Feminist Art. She has the whole fourth floor for this, you know. And what are feminists? Well, they're mostly, you know, they hate man. They, they openly say it, kill the patriarchy. I will show it again here. And... Um, they usually are, the feminists, they usually are uh, pink list killers. And just remember, I, I, as I told you, so many pink list killers were among the Nazis, you know, killing people in, and, and raping them in the concentration camps with this inverse pyramid, which you, or the inverse triangle or inverse pyramid, which you just saw in their art. And remember Jutta Rudiger, you know, she was the head of the German uh, Bund Deutscher Mädels, the Nazis, an, an enormous influence on the German population. And she was a pink list killer. People, this is all connected with the Nazis and genocides and inverted pyramids and pink list killers and the Sackler family population control, it's all connected in Switzerland. Can't you see it? So here it is. It was a war memorial with graves and people murdered in concentration camps. And it's, it's the same, it's the same triangle. And, and look at the cornerstone. It's also, I, 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 I saw it there, you know, that it's in a different color, like, as you can see here, uh, 
as 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 in that sort of art thing it's it's the same you know and it's all about war population control deep population world wars dynasties pharaoh this, this strange pharaonic culture with their sort of art it's always their art is always about triangles and and two pillars and you know so here's the um the title weird things on the road to ancient french templar commandery on my channel Gure. so here i made a um i i made a little comparison of the two exactly the same things here here, look here this is different here too you know so this is what happens you know first it's it's being showed it's being shown in a museum like here and then you know the freemasons of a town or a city they buy it and then it ends up like here you know it's a death cult and they're feeding on us i mean they got plates here with organs they're feeding on us you know with the inverse triangles like in Auschwitz and this is related to the war it's a war memorial where, where people got butchered in concentration camps you know like like the the genocide with the with the oxycontin pills you know it was it, it is a genocide uh, and it's a Nazi pill it's all related yeah look at it the moment I saw this it went click dang and I I saw it in my mind you know which happens all the time, you know, when I see these symbols. Wakey, wakey, people. And here, they even say it openly now, you know, kill the patriarchy here in pink with, with this feminist symbol here. They say it openly. I mean, it's an appeal for violence, you know. Nobody does a thing. But if I talk about it, I get my video removed or, you know. And they are in politics now. And even many, if not most, in his government here of Pharaoh Macronos II, uh, many, and if not most, are Pinkless killers. I mean, we can see it happening. I will give you the names in the, in the next video. The names are there, you know. It's um, okay, but um, we are not allowed to think... Um, or not allowed to say that it is a conspiracy so i will not say that yeah because it's not allowed yeah so we don't say that no of course we don't eh? they just want to kill the patriarchy but you know here the feminists and these ones here you know and no no of course it's not a conspiracy of course not no no i didn't say it you didn't hear me say it so Leave me alone with all your laws and your censorship, okay? I did not say it. So I show it to you anyway. These five here are, are all ministers, you know, very important people who rule France. And they're all pink list killers. All these five, they openly admit it. And I guess, you know, if you look at Pharaoh Macronos II himself and remember the video I did about him, how he's been hugging naked Nubians all the time, walking hand in hand with known Pinkless killers. Um, I suspect that all the, the entire government are. I, I mean, look at the situation in France, you know, it's almost a, um, a civil war and um so just put one on one together you know you got a whole bunch of pink list killers in the government and france is at the edge of a civil war is there a correlation is there i'm not allowed to answer that for you because of the censorship so i give you the names these one openly admitted yeah uh, these five came out of the closet so here is gabriel atal openly admitted they, they got their word for it which uh, you know I, I don't even want to say that when they admitted a, a minister i i don't remember what minister maybe i'll show it in the next video you know olivier dussopt the next one pink list killer a minister clement boone a pink list killer and a minister 
This one here, she's Moroccan, French Moroccan. Sarah El Hayri, a pink list killer. Oh, the, the Muslims will like that. And um, a minister, she's the minister of youth. Can you imagine? It reminds me of Jutta Rudiger, the pink list killer, the Nazi pink list killer, being at the head of the Bund Deutscher Medals, you know, the, uh, the organization of uh, German uh, girlies. Um, you know, they, they love to, to apparently to seek this uh, due to their sexual orientation to, um, to, to, to take a, a, um, a job, you know, which is next to children, apparently, like this one here and Jutta Rudiger. I mean, these are facts. It's not me saying this, yeah? And this one here, Frank Rista, another minister. He reminds me of that uh, priest that was uh, um, that was hitting himself on his back, you know, in the uh, the, the the film Da Vinci Code. Uh, it looks exactly like him. Right? Gives me that creeps, really. So all five pink list killers, ministers, France is being ruled by pink list killers, and look at the situation. It's going to be a, a civil war, you know. It's, it's, we are on the edge of it now. So is there a relation? I cannot answer that for you. You'll answer that yourselves. So as we could see again in this secular OxyContin Purdue case, all these huge crimes and tragedies can always be traced back to Switzerland the Nazis, their Knights Templars, and their aristocracy, because Switzerland is the base of Pharaoh and their elite dynasty bloodlines who house the Nazi Templars in their octagon base in the Alps, the Swiss beast, home of the devil. The Swiss are the only people in the world that can murder millions of Americans without the FBI come knocking at their doors afterwards. And Switzerland is the only country in the world where the money they earned through the murder of millions of American OxyContin drug addicts can go to in all security without the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, come knocking at their doors. Whereas any other country in the world that would have perpetrated such massive crimes against the American population would have been invaded by the all-powerful American army immediately. Like that backward third world country, Afghanistan, who never did anything against the American population except stopping the drugs trade and in fact helping the American population. Whereas the Swissies, their settlers and their Nazi banks get filthy rich through the murder on Americans, through the OxyContin drugs money. Now, all safely in a Swiss vault in Switzerland, the base of all evil. So here it says, Purdue American cartel with this concept of three and four in the Pharaonic Colors logo. Secklers are murderers. So here and you see devils here. The people are protesting in America. You should protest in front of the Swiss embassy or protest in Switzerland. 
that they will put you in prison for a long time if you would protest in Swaziland. Now, this is interesting. I think this is the Justice Department. And what do I see? I see a square, which is the concept of four. And I see a circle, which stands for the, the compass and the, the concept of three. So only here at the door of the Justice Department, it says uh, square and compass, Freemasonry. And uh, so here it says Staat, Swaziland. That's where they went to, people. So it looks very nice, you know, with a, a looking devil and a nice uh, a shield here showing it all and a skeleton all dressed up with uh, Oxycontin bottles. But the most important, you don't know, or you don't want to know, that they went to Staat in Switzerland. You know, and all the other Nazi connections, the uh, paperclip uh, or um, uh, connections uh, with the Nazi Templars and the Swiss banks. I mean, you have to go deeper into it, people. This is not deep enough, you know, like showing a little devil and a, and a nice uh, sign here. It's not enough. You must go deeper into it. Because you can protest, you know, do that for a few weeks and then everybody forgets about it as usual. Didn't work at all. There's no other country in the world that financed Hitler and the Nazis, then stole all the savings of the jaywalkers. A country that produced flamethrowers for the Russian genocide. A country that financed Operation Barbarossa with one billion Swiss francs that participated in making the Nazi atom bomb that got rich of slavery, used concentration camp inmates, and after the war didn't get invited for the Nuremberg trials where in fact the Swissies should have been at the front row of the accused war criminals. There's no other country than Switzerland who are definitely behind the Ukraine war through the Swiss secrets or Swiss secret banking scandal. Four days before the Ukraine war. The country where Putin, Russian oligarchs and Russian mafia keep their money and own big villas and consequently won't even get mentioned with a single word by these NATO criminals and EU liars. Are you dumb to not see this? Can't you see we're being fooled about the huge criminal energy by this country and its people? Switzerland is the beast standing above all the laws, camouflaged under the veil of neutrality, clean and innocent looking. And I've given you all the proofs over the last 12 years. I was the only one in the world and in the entire human history that has revealed all this to you. And I fear now it has all been in vain because humanity are just dumb slaves and a bunch of cowards who will never unite and stand up against this evil operating out of the Alps. There never was any William Tell, as you can see here. It was all from a book by Friedrich von Schiller who was German and not even Swiss. They destroyed me and my family. 
because I opened up my mouth about it, which has cost me dearly. You just don't criticize Switzerland and the Swiss if you want to continue to live in peace, because they'll get you sooner or later if you do so. Be aware of the near future, for I have warned you, and yet you have done nothing. An apple a day keeps the Swiss away. A parody on the fake William Tell story in the wake of its false propaganda within the realm of political satire. An apple a day keeps the Swiss away. At the moment, there's a lot of talk again about the Swiss Nazi Templar Bank, Credit Suisse, that apparently went broke with 6 billion Swiss francs in debt. And on March 19th, the other huge Swiss bank, UBS, announced to buy the CS Credit Suisse for 3.25 billion Swiss francs. I already told you in my videos how the giant Swiss pharmaceutical company Roche on November the 4th, 2021, bought 33% of his own company back for $20.7 billion from the other Swiss pharmaceutical giant called Novartis. And that Swiss Roche and Swiss Novartis are in fact one single company divided by differentiated tactics for better attack strategies on the world market. And now Swiss CS and Swiss UBS doing the very same, meaning they have been one single company all along. And when a company disappears by bankruptcy, there will be no more debt paid out to the people to whom the Credit Suisse Bank owes a couple of billions in total. So UBS inherits a clean new bank without any debts to be paid. And this is why the sly Swissies split up their giant banks and their giant pharmaceutical companies in two. So when lose the game, no more liability whatsoever which is a win-win situation as a result of splitting up their companies. And remember the huge Credit Suisse scandal called Suisse Secret from February the 20th, 2022, which triggered the Ukraine war four days later and which I've explained to you in my videos. The Swiss Nazi Templar banks are incredible, ruthless gangsters. So here it says Swiss Nazi Templar banks with the Swiss flag 
which is in fact the Knights Templars colors red and white it's the only flag in the world which is a square and they turn it around this is the Hospitallers who have a white cross on a red on the ground because when the Knights Templars they got forbidden in 1291 when Switzerland was founded all the wealth of the Nazi temp of the, the Knights Templars, it all went into the hands of the Hospitallers who have a white cross on a red underground. And this is where the wealth of the Knights Templars went to, to Switzerland. And the Knights Templars, they founded the banks, they founded the Czech, they were the first multinationals in history. And this is the result. Credit Suisse and UBS. UBS, that means the United Banksters of Switzerland. And this is the logo of UBS. Three keys for the concept of three. They got a Templar V here in the key. They got a lot of sixes for the 666. This is a six here in the, um, in the key. Altogether, there are six keys or six parts here of the, of the of all the keys here and here you can see part of the logo of Credit Suisse who had in fact a almost a swastika logo uh, before Swiss Nazi Templar banks and it goes on and it goes on and it goes on nobody is stopping them so in this video here, here's the title on my uh, channel Gure on the Brighton uh, video platform. Um, I put it on Brighton because of the um, because of the censorship on YouTube. They would definitely take it off, you know. So here you can see um, in this video here, the last one how I explained that the uh, the two biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world, the Swiss Roche and the Swiss uh, Novartis, that they are in fact one company. And now they're doing it as the, again with uh, the UBS and the Credit Suisse. It's all out of tactical reasons. And of course, uh, so no liability, financial liability most of all, um will be taken it's um it's a scam really and here in this video here you can um i'll give all the proofs and i explain how the um the scandal of the um credit suisse uh last year how it triggered the ukraine war four day four days later after the scandal so here it says Swiss Secret. This is Swiss because of Credit Suisse, the same bank. And I explain you uh, what happened and why um, the bankruptcy of the uh, Credit Suisse, in fact, it's related to the um, to the Ukraine war. And so the video can be seen on YouTube, on my channel Gure, which is out of use, out of for the moment uh, because of the YouTube censorship. And here's the title, Ukraine War Made in Switzerland. I will put it in the description below the video if I won't forget it. Here on the uh, picture you see uh, Putin and here the, um, the guys of the Arab Emirates an emir that's like a pharaoh like a, a prince you know it's a it's a um a title of the nobility emir like the word emirate emir emirat and um it's of the pharaohocracy well they both are so i'll read it for you so putin he's saying i'll empty that swiss bank and bring you my assets and my money from the credit suisse Okay, Harasho. So today's bankruptcy of Credit Suisse in 2023, and exactly one year after the Swiss Secret 
scandal of February the 20th, 2022 are of course related to each other, giving the oligarchs Putin and his mafia pals the various members of the aristocracy and the Russian Mafia and the Italian Mafia one year time to withdraw all their money from the Swiss Credit Suisse and transfer it to the Arab Emirates while the world's media, the EU, the NATO, Mr. Putin, Zelensky and the US were distracting us one year long with all their lies around that low intensity war called the Ukrainian war with a special purpose, the time needed to empty the CS Credit Suisse from all its sensitive criminal banking assets by Pharaoh's worldwide mafia. And now this happened exactly one year after that enormous bank scandal, Swiss Secret, about which I talked about in my videos. While that's done and the Rusky oligarchs' money safe in the Arab Emirates, today, March the 19th, 2023, and one year later, after the huge Swiss Secret banking scandal and the one year Ukraine war distraction, the bank is empty. The Swiss Credit Suisse CS bank is empty. The money is safe. The Credit Suisse bank dumped, sacrificed, and the Ukraine war ready to end for the obvious reasons herewith explained. The global mafia of Pharaoh and their Swiss base have fooled us all along and just sacrificed a whole bunch of Ukrainians and their children in order to bring their stolen wealth into safety and far, far, far away, like in, in a fairy tale of 1001 Nights. But for us, it's more like a horror tale. So here it says Credit Suisse, these buildings, we know them, they are the Emirates. Here are some of the yachts of the the uh, uh, Ruski, Ruski um, oligarchs, just say mafia, eh? Ruski mafia. Vorizagonia, Ruski. And here, the money. So the Credit Suisse money transfer to the Arab Emirates. This is where it's all about. And it all got triggered on February the 20th. 2022, when they miraculously stopped, like pushing a button, they, they stopped Pharaoh's bug war as well. Four days later, the Ukraine war, you know, just sacrificing these people only for this yachts, money, wealth. All right. As I've told you numerous times, the Swissies are always in it, people. Just follow the money trail and it will always end up in Pharaoh's neutral utopia in the Alps. 
the Octagon Fortress, who, after the global financial crisis of 2008, immediately applied for a banking license in the Arab Emirates, meaning that the banks in the United Arab Emirates of the worldwide aristocracy still are Swiss Nazi Templar banks of the Octagon in the Alps. And Putin is their Swiss sleeper agent and coded the Black Prince of the Baltic St. Petersburg Teutonic Knights. So here it says Octagon logo on the hats. These guys here, they have an Octagon logo. Coincidence? <laughs> And here it says Putin is Swiss sleeper agent. And this here on the left hand side is Octagon of the Nazi Templars. They all belong to it. For the obvious reasons, the Swiss banks change their names all the time. So they can disappear now and then and do some neutral reset. And the original name of the CS Credit Suisse was Schweizerische Kreditanstalt. And this was their logo. So here it says SKA, that means Schweizerische Kreditanstalt. From 1968 to 1976, they had this here. And then from 1976 to 1997, when Lady Diana died, they had this here. But also with this, I wrote it down here, Nazi swastika similarity. So, I mean, there is a similarity with a swastika. I mean, you can see that immediately, can't you now? Everyone who sees a hidden Nazi swastika in the logo, please stick up your right hand. No, not like that, silly. Okay, I get your point. So here it says, everyone stick up uh, their right hand. So here you see a Swiss cross. Here it says Helvetic with another Swiss cross. And here, so here you see a bunch of Swiss Nazis sticking up their right hand because they saw the similarity of the um, the former Credit Suisse uh, swastika Nazi logo. Thank you, guys. So here you see the Nubian with a Swiss cross here and a, um, a iron collar around his or her neck with a chain on it. And here it says Credit Suisse and the, uh, the Swiss flag. I'll read it for you. Swiss slave driver family Escher founded Swiss Credit Suisse SKA, Schweizerische Kreditanstalt, Nazi Templer Bank by Alfred Escher. Credit Suisse, under its old name, Schweizerische Kreditanstalt, was founded 167 years ago, in the year 1856, in Zurich, Switzerland, by Alfred Escher. And the Escher family owned a slave plantation in Cuba called Buen Retiro, owning about 90 slaves and probably many, many more and many more slave plantations also in America as they were doing business 
uh, in the um, cotton industry. And as I told you so in my older videos, the Swissies were deep into the slave trade, with most of the slave ships belonging to the Swiss. Because the Knights Templars who founded Swaziland had an enormous fleet to get all the wealth and the Templars treasure into Switzerland and to get all the Crusaders towards Jerusalem and cross the Mediterranean from, the, um, from Sicily. So here, uh, two and a half minutes, it's a bit difficult to read here. So here you can read all the Swiss names involved in the Swiss slavery. And here is the name Escher. So I have to run the video so you can see it. Now you can see it here, here. That says Escher from Zurich. You see here. These are the ones. This is the family that founded the Credit Suisse, Mr. Putin his bank, Hitler his bank, the slavery bank, and so forth and so on. So the video can be seen, I think I made it like 12 years ago or seven years ago, but I think I made it before and had to re-upload it, it got um, censored, so there you can see Escher, and it's on my older channel, Gatsefrats, and here is the title. If I don't forget, I'll put it in the description underneath the video. And here it says, Swiss involvement in slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. You know, everywhere where they can make a big dollar, you know, they are there. So here we can read about Credit Suisse and uh, the former name here, Schweizerische Kreditanstalt, here it says, with that funny logo. By the way, this logo here, uh, there's a, a white triangle in it and it has a square in it. So the square is here and the triangle is the concept of three that stands for the compass so it does say square and compass the concepts of three and the concept of four and um, and square and compass is of course uh, white for the for the new world order the uh, the old um, And uh, red was for the old world order, or still is actually. And so here is that logo. It really looks like a swastika. It has a swastika in it. Well, of course, you know they were dealing with the Nazis, you know. And. So you just punch pause if you want to read it. But uh, ah, this is what I wanted to show you, the history. And Credit Suisse founder was Alfred, Alfred Escher. Um, there he is. And this family was into slavery. Yeah. Highly criminal family, you know, the, and uh, which we can still see in this uh, in this bank here. And here, they, you know, they call it controversies. You know, the the various crimes where they which which they did. Here, the Forex manipulation, the US tax fraud conspiracy 2014. Uh, well, you can read it yourself. 
a spionage scandal, you know, it's, it's without end. And here, this is very important, Swiss Secret, Swiss Secrets League 2022. Well, it was actually on uh, February the 20th, just four days before the Ukraine war. And among, uh, so I'll read this for you, details of 30,000 customers holding over 100 billion Swiss francs in accounts um, at the bank were leaked to the Süddeutsche Zeitung and became known as uh, Swiss Secret. Among those with accounts at the bank were a human trafficker, a torturer, drug traffickers, and a Vatican-run account that allegedly invested 350 million fraudulently, fraudulently in London property. On February the 20th, Oh, there we go. There we got the date. Credit Suisse said it strongly rejects allegations of wrongdoing. Well, of, of course, yeah. Now they're, now they're gone. And here, the Russian oligarch loans, documents, destruction after invasion of Ukraine. Well, of course, you know, they all went to the, um, to the Arab Emirates. You know, following Swiss sanction on Russia during the 2022 Russian invasion of Ukraine, Credit Suisse issued legal requests asking hedge funds and other investors to destroy documents linking Russian oligarchs to yacht loans, a move which they faced considerable criticism. A uh, launch approach to demanding documents linked to the bank's compliance with sanction on Russian oligarchs. Of course, they destroyed it because, you know, the money ha had to go to the Arab Emirates and it's, it shouldn't be linked anymore to, uh, to this highly criminal bank. So there he is, the man who founded the Credit Suisse and uh, which by that time still had the name of uh, Schweizerische Kreditanstalt. And Alfred Escher was born in Zurich into the Escher vom Glas family, an old and influential dynasty. So if you see these double names, you know, this is nobility, Escher vom Glas. But because in Switzerland, you know, they, um, they had the, uh, the horizontal de democratic um, rule of the Knights Templars, you know, all these, um, most of the uh, nobility titles, you know, just disappeared. Um, because nobility, they uh, rule in a vertical rule, which we can see now coming back all over the world, you know. The feudal system is coming back. And uh, especially here in France with all the things going on, you know, they, um, they, Macron now he can take decisions through a new law that uh, people that he can um, make new laws without you without using the parliament. It's not going to be debated or elected. So this is uh, feudal. You know that's why so many people are going on the streets and everything. You know. Um, so. So he's, they call him the founder of modern Switzerland. So he's a Freemason, keeping his hand like this under his jacket, the right hand. They always do that. And here it is, Credit Suisse. And here, Alfred Escher didn't like this state of affairs. In 1856, he succeeded in establishing a new bank. Schweizerische Kreditanstalt, now known as Credit Suisse, primarily for the purpose of securing financing for his own rail company, the Swiss Northeastern Railway. Increasingly, however, Escher's bank financed other public and private sector endeavors too, uh, thereby developing into an important lender for the Swiss economy and the founding institution of Zurich's financial center. Well, Zurich, together with um, um, 
I forgot the name, the German town, that they are really the financial centers of uh, uh, Frankfurt. They are the, the financial centers of uh, Europe, Zurich and Frankfurt. And um, well, Frankfurt is, of course, um, Baron von Rothschild, the nobility of the uh, jaywalkers, who are no jaywalkers at all. Um, this one too, you know, the old pharaohs, this is nobility. Who still rule the entire world, the pharaohistocracy. So now I'm going to show you about his, um, about the Asher family being into slavery. Yeah, a highly criminal family. So in this article, it shows the Asher family. Yeah, one of Zurich's most famous industrial families, the Eschers, also have direct links to the slave trade, but there's no evidence of the involvement of its most famous son, Alfred Escher. Other members of the family ran a coffee plantation in Cuba that held around 90 slaves. So, but as the family, they were in the, uh, they were also, here it says, they were in the textile uh, business. And textile, well, in those days, you, you, you need cotton. And cotton is, of course, it's very much related to slavery. And that's also the Escher family. So, I mean, they kept it secret. I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And of course, there's more articles to, to find about this in German than in English. So I just show one article in German. Here, the Alfred Escher, Sklaven, Plantage. Uh, Sklaven, it means slaves. It's the same word, they only have a K here. Don't ask me why. And plantage, it means plantation, slave plantation on Cuba. Uh, Credit Suisse, Alfred Escher, you see. And um, so this is just the tip of the iceberg, you know. They, most of the crimes they, they kept it um, hidden. Uh, Credit Suisse, um, Sklaven Plantage von Escher's family. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, they, they had more than one slave plantation as they were working in the, uh, in the textile industry as well. Yeah. So this is the same article here, yeah? Sklaverei, slavery. And, uh, so I have to show you this also. You know that I'm, you know, to give some proofs, at least. Let me just punch pause. So here, there's some more. Zurich was linked to slavery through state bonds, trade, and plantations. The city of Zurich supported slavery and slave trade in the 18th century, so in the 1700s, financially and played a role in the deportation of thousands of Africans. Moreover, the city was linked to slavery through the cotton industry. So you see, they had plantations, only we don't know the names now. And, uh, you know, and as a study by historians of the University of Zurich. So, there you see a nice picture. Well, not very nice at all. And so here you can see again, you know, that slavery, it's the, uh, it's the elite, their dynasties, it's the nobility behind slavery like this uh, Escher von Glas, or, or that's an aristocratic name. And you, you don't get big if you don't belong to them, if you're not part of the fair aristocracy. 
So I hope all the Nubians and other people, I mean, the white people are slaves themselves, you know. In the feudal system, they were thousands years long as slaves under the Roman Empire. 70% uh, of the Europeans, they were slaves, you know. We're all slaves. The American Indians are slaves, you know. Well, only Pharaoh couldn't make them work, you know. <laughs> more into hunting and you know being free uh, so it's not the really the white race behind it it's the, it's the nobility the dynasties the fair aristocracy and their base is switzerland with their big banks like credit suisse they are the they're big pharmaceutical industries uh, yeah, I'll read it for you. Their study shows that, like other towns, Zurich was involved in financing the transatlantic slave trade. In the 18th century, for example, Zurich purchased shares in the South Sea Company, a British company that actively traded slaves. During the time Zurich held these shares, the South Sea Company deported 8,636 African people across the Atlantic to America. In the same period, the company also shipped 27,858 slaves from predominantly British islands such as Jamaica and Barbados to the Spanish colonies. The city of Zurich was therefore financially involved in the deportation of a total of 3,000 36,494 Africans, says the, the, the study. So that's a lot. I told you that. And this is how Zurich became the financial center of Europe, together with uh, Frankfurt for the, um, for the other reasons. So this is where I stopped before, 36,494 Africans and the Swiss, they are involved in it. And furthermore, the city of Zurich was invested in slave trade through the semi-governmental Zinskommission Loi. Um, Yeah, I'll read it for you. Besides these direct investment, the Zurich textile industry also held structural ties to slavery. For example, the Indian fabrics manufactured in Zurich in the 18th century were used as a key trading commodity for pur purchasing slaves in West Africa. Moreover, in the 19th century, the Zurich cotton industry sourced most of its material from slave plantations in the south of the US. Some of the industrial and commercial enterprises to emerge from this sector went on to take up leading positions in the 20th century Swiss economy and played a significant part in contributing to Switzerland's wealth. Involvement of the Escher family. Oh, here it says, the Escher family, you know, the ones who founded the Credit Suisse, the Escher family is the most well-known example from a fairly large, large number of Zurich families that held ties to the colonial world and were often also involved in slavery in a variety of ways. Um, Alfred Escher, one of the founding fathers of modern modern day Switzerland, did not own any plantations or slaves himself. You know, this is what I told you, they differentiate, like they make two banks out of one bank, like he openly, he was not involved into slavery or plantations, he was doing the other part for the plantations, yeah, the money part, yeah, and the, and the, the, um, the, the part of the politics, because he was in the, uh, he was a, a senator, and uh, this is what they do. It's the same with the, um, the pharmaceutical industry, Roche and Novartis. They, they made two or probably even more companies out of one company. 
So, you know, so there's no liability. Yeah, they, they can't be blamed for immoral things. And this, this is what Alfred Asher, he knew very well and he did the same thing. He just uh, openly, uh, he didn't have anything to do with it, but he did. Uh, however, his grandfather, Hans Kaspar Escher, funded at least one slave ship. And his father, Heinrich Escher, was a successful trader and investor in the US. And his uncle, Friedrich Ludwig Escher, ran the Buen Retiro coffee plantation in Cuba with over 80 slaves. The Asher family was thus linked to slavery in various ways. So you can read the whole article yourself. I mean, this is a um, conglomerate, you know, the, the, the whole family is into slavery, into banking and money. And um, this is the aristocracy, people. If you would even would make so much money, they wouldn't let you keep it. They come with laws, they come with police, and they they would take away all your money. You know? So it's not enough to make money. You you need to be part of the bloodlines in order to keep it, expand it, and uh, uh, and to be above all laws. As Switzerland is, that's why they call it neutral. And it's not neutral for us, the normal people, not the, the white Europeans and everybody else. It's not neutral for us, you know, they, they you get terrorized in that country, they, they do what they want, they lie stuff together. Uh, they hate foreigners, even white foreigners like myself and many others. No, it's neutral for the aristocracy. They can hide their money. It's neutral, neutral in this respect that other pharaohs and other ones of the nobility, of pharaoh's nobility, they can't attack other pharaohs inside Switzerland because it's neutral for them only. You see, that's why they hide all the money in Switzerland. But I have a feeling they're going to dump Switzerland now. All, all the all the money is going to the Arab Emirates. It's even further away from from everything. There's a, there's a big dip in between, you know. So they can continue to do what they what they want, you know. So there are no like uh, university professors sticking their noses too deep in it because it's not possible, you know. It's too far away. So this is why the Credit Suisse now, uh, it went bankrupt. Um, well, not directly because of this, but because all the money had been, has been taken off, has been taken out and shipped over to the, uh, the United Arab Emirates. So Swiss Secret is probably the biggest banking scandal ever. There are 30,000 clients here, 30,000 Credit Suisse bank customers. Uh, on um, February 20th, 2022, the Süddeutsche Zeitung reported that over a year ago, it had received secret data through a secure digital mailbox. Uh, you know, the guy stayed anonymous because he knows how, how they kill people in Switzerland. And this is actually, you know, because I criticized the Swissies in international newspapers in 2010 and before and afterwards, uh, that they completely terrorized me there for, for a quarter of a century, you know, put me in prison for five and a half years. Uh, I got arrested several times by the anti-terrorist court, putting guns in my head. Uh, you know, if, if you criticize the Swiss banks, you're dead. This is how it is, you know. So, he talks about the Organized Crime Corruption Reporting Project. 
And um, so here, the notable people named, you know, it's all the fair aristocracy, eh? King Abdullah II of Jordan, Queen Rania of Jordan. Uh, Aliaksei Alexin, Belarusian businessman, blacklisted by the EU and US, close associate uh, of Alexander Lukashenko. Well, we all know that one. Uh, Hashim Yavan Bakht, Pakistani politician. Um, Haji Saifullah Khan Bangash, pa Pakistani politician. They're probably all corrupt, you know, politicians. Anyway, all politicians are uh, of the fair aristocracy. They're all of the nobility. It, you know, Louis Alphonse de Bourbon, the Bourbon. Uh, is a uh, is the head of the House of Bourbon, members of the family formerly ruled France and other countries, according to the legitimists. Louis Alphonse is considered the pretender to the defunct tr throne of France, as Louis the Twentieth, with the death of his father. You know. So it's uh, the upper nobility. Anas El Fiki, the F Egypt former Minister of Information, Iv I Ivan Guta, Ukrainian agricultural baron, uh, is a Ukrainian entrepreneur and co-founder of Maria Agro Holding Public L Limited, one of Ukraine's largest grain producers. He defaulted on his debt in 2014 after the family had moved over 200 million into shell companies, uh, an oligarch. Yeah. I mean, wh why do you want to hide money in, in Switzerland, you know? Because they're all crooks. Well, a Syrian, Abdul Halim Kadam, Syrian politician, Zahid Ali Akbar Khan, Lieutenant General, well, you don't become a general or a higher politician if you're not part of the fair aristocracy. Pakistani politician Sultan Ali Lakani, uh, the owner of McDonald's Pakistan. Another pharaoh, a sultan, that's a aristocratic title. Louis Carlo de Leon, which is a um, aristocratic um, name, everything with de. You know, de Leon of of the lions. You know, and the lion is a symbol of the aristocracy. Um, in Venezuela, the financial director of the uh, electricity. Pavlo Lazarenko, prime minister of Ukraine, the former. Ronald Lee of the Hong Kong. Ferdinand Marcos, well, we know how corrupted that one is or was. Uh, Imelda Marcos, the first lady of the Philippines. They all went to prison, I think. Probably still are in prison. Hisham Talat Mustafa, Egyptian real estate magnate. Uh, Gamal Mubarak, the uh, Egyptian rulers, the president of Egypt, the sons. Saad Kair, Jordanian. And you know, the Russian oligarchy and, and Putin, you know, they're all in the Arab world, you know. And I mean, look at it. Who gave all the weapons and the arms to the Arab world in order to attack the, uh, the JJ base? Right? And all, all the weapons they, they have is Russian. The tanks, the airplanes, the Kalashnikov, the, the entire Muslim world, uh, they have Russian weapons. So, you know, that's why they're all together here, you know. Khaled Nazar, a general. Akhtar Abdul Rahman, Billy Raltenbach, Zimbabwe. Kosim Robar. They're all very influential a Serbian drug lord, Radoljub Radulovic, 
you know, drugs and it's, it's, you put it at the same level as slavery, you know, it's, they don't care, you know, these pharaohs with what they can make money. And they always use Switzerland. They have been using it for 800 years, you know, since it was founded in 1291 to hide all their wealth there. And it seems they're going to abandon Switzerland. So I hope, you know, the, um, it's going to fall. Former president of Armenia, German Eduard Seidel, the biggest bribe scandal in German history. Wow. Alvaro Sobrino, Angolan banker, James Song, Taiwan. He was in the uh, Taiwan frigate scandal. They're all crooks. Look at that. Uh, Omar Mahmoud Soleiman, uh, former vice president and the former head of the Egyptian intelligence, the uh, Kazakhstan, Talibov, Azerbaijan, uh, Calabrian Andrangheta. Antonio Velardo also having his money there, Nervis Villa Lobos. So imagine when this Swiss secret when it happened, you know. They all almost they all almost got a heart attack. Thirty thousand people got a heart attack almost. Another frigate scandal, Bruno Wang. And they all started, you know, on February the 20th here they immediately started to get their money out of Sw of switzerland out of the uh the swiss credit swiss bank uh, and of course using the uh using the um the big yachts you know to uh to ship it all over you know and and with their own airplanes and everything to to get it into the arab emirates so I hope the JJ base is going to do something about the uh, the United Arab Emirates, which also has nothing to do with the Arab people. You know, it's it's pure pharaonic. So back then, the Swiss Asher family and their Credit Suisse bank were into slavery. During World War II, they had the Nazis use their Swiss Credit Suisse banks. And today, they are associated with Putin's mafia. And the Swiss Credit Suisse triggered the Ukraine war. The father of Alfred Escher by the name of Henry Escher, opened the first Hottinger Bank in America for his friend Baron Jean Conrad Hottinger, a Swiss nobleman with both a fleur de lis for the vertical rule and a Templar's cross for the horizontal rule in his code. <coughs> his coat of arms and that is typical swissy you know they do both and switzerland is the neutral base for the fair aristocracy so here's this coat of arms and fleur de lis is vertical rule the old world's order and the templar's cross is the horizontal rule the republic the uh, the new world order and of course in this swiss coat of arms you can find both because switzerland is the neutral place where they can both uh, come and be uh, protected because switzerland is neutral but only for the pharistocracy or pharaoh's nobility so here is uh, Baron Jean-Conrad Hottinger, 
and he was born in uh, here in Zurich in 1764 and so here it says in the beginning 19th century a family friend and associate Henry Escher established the first Hottinger representative office in America. His son, Alfred Escher, founded Credit Suisse, the Ecole Polytechnique of Zurich. This is the ETH in German and the school where Rudolf Huss, he went to, the second man in the, in the Nazi Third Reich. And he founded the Gotthard Rail. You remember the um, the tunnel ritual of the Gotthard? Well, it's all related. Before being made president of the National Council, that's the Swiss Senate. There are 200 blokes in there and, and girlies too. For his achievements, the city of Zurich recognizes him with a statue. So these are very, very influential uh, dynasties and they are settled um, in the United States with their coats of arms and everything and their banks and huge money out of the neutral base where all dynasties, where they all keep their money. Since hundreds of years, the very powerful Swiss Escher dynasty have set foot into the ruling upper class of America. No wonder America will never do anything against these highly criminal Swiss Nazi banks. So here's another ancestors of the Escher dynasty. His name is Heinrich Escher. He lived in the uh, 17th century, the 1600s. So that's like 450 years ago. That's a long time. There he is. And it says he was active as a merchant in the textile trade. So we just learned before the Swiss textile trade, they were connected with the cotton plantations in the America in America, and they had uh, they were into slavery, financing it and even having their own plantations. And as a representative of the buyers, he was a member of the delegation for the renewal of the Alliance of Zurich with Louis the 14th that's the French Sun King Louis the 14th that's the oldest um that was the oldest uh, king uh, who who's who was a king f uh, longest in the history uh, i think he was a king like more than 60 years or 70 years longer than queen elizabeth and longer than uh, Pharaoh Ramses II, he was quite long as well. So that was the, the longest ruling king. Okay, that was the word I was looking for. And after the Treaty of Geneva and the wall dance had taken up there, Escher uh, in 1687 with a representative of Bern came to the court of Louis XIV, the Sun King. So he went in and out of the court of Louis the Fourteenth, and um, it's the nobility of their uh, neutral base in the Alps, the Octagon, Pharaoh's neutral base. So because they got a lot of internal strife and problems, and even kill each other, and they decided, okay, we have a neutral place where we can put the money. Nobody's going to steal it. There won't be any murders or, or killings amongst ourselves okay in switzerland they kill other people who are not of the nobility and uh, that's why it's neutral people 
And the Swiss people are not a people, but they are a product. Because the, um, the essential of a people is a people come in one color of skin and they come in one language. All other things, it's not a people. They are a product or a mix like the Americans and also the jaywalkers, they're not a people, but a product. And more than 30 years ago, I had my first bad experiences with this Swiss Nazi bank, Credit Suisse. By then, still having that Nazi logo, when they stole all the money, I had on me 10 Swiss francs and they really shouldn't have done that because I immediately had this Swiss robbery escalate. A crazy story which I will tell you now. Over 30 years ago I was in a Swiss Credit Suisse bank in the capital of Bern while being a homeless in France and sleeping outside with a huge backpack. But I just wanted to look what Switzerland was about for a few days, merely passing through. But I understood pretty soon that I shouldn't stay there for too long because in that huge Swiss Credit Suisse Nazi bank with solid marble floors and whatnot. I wanted to change about 11 Swiss francs of tiny coins as I had been begging for some money in the Swiss capital the hours before as I was hungry and hadn't eaten for days in a row. So I was already quite itchy, if you know what I mean. So here it says Swiss banks don't like homeless people very much. So I poured out a sort of a replica of a Swiss mountain in copper coins in front of the Swiss cashier lady at the counter and asked her to give me a bill so I could buy me some scoff. That's food in British slang. You have to go to the machine behind you near the wall, she said. Okay, I moaned, already disliking the tone in the Swiss marble shebang and shoved my Swiss copper mountain back in my two hands and went to the machine while already attracting dozens of those weird Swiss looks all around me, stinging in my back, most of all. So this is the Swiss bank. This is me with my hand full of coins. And here it says the Swiss credits, Credit Suisse bank stole all my money. I shoveled my Swiss mountain into the Swiss money machine and thought, great, I've never seen that before. As I already had accumulated a great deal of changing coins experiences in the various countries of Europe over the years. The machine literally absorbed my Swiss mountain, making a weird sound which reminded me slightly of a burp, like the money monster just swallowing a Swiss mountain in one single go. And I was still very hungry and getting more and more South African style itchy marble floors, burping money machines, cold sterile Swiss Nazi bank, annoying bankster personnel and getting serious incoming by all those worrisome looks around me. So I crossed the huge marble floor once again while being scrutinized and Swiss eyeballed by nearly everyone in there. I finally made it and feeling quite light with only a tiny receipt from the burping machine that had me lightened of my heavy Swiss copper mountain. 
I almost felt naked returning with only that tiny shade of paper and that huge marble floor getting eyeball from everyone. So here's that floor. Um, I couldn't find that flaw in the bank, but it looked very similar. This is from inside the Swiss Parliament, but it, it's the same, you know. Actually, the opposite from the Swiss Parliament, that bank. So, and here's that machine. Here it says, Burping Swiss Money Machine. That's what it did. So, I gave the receipt to the lady, and she gave me back only 35 cents Swiss wrappings for my whole mountain of Swiss copper coins while she was display, displaying an obvious big smile all over her beforehand monotonous expression she had. She was definitely having the time of her life, enjoying the Swiss-German Schadenfreude, which means joy for damage in English, saying it all that we don't even have similar expressions in English, revealing the whole apparent mindset. It must have been obvious by my looks that they had a scabby, hungry, homeless in their fancy bank on that huge sterile marble floor, feeling like being inside a funeral home seconds before getting incinerated. And I tell you, the Swiss shakedown, together with the rest of the ingredients, actually felt like the very end on that huge sterile marble floor in a funeral home. I want to see the manager, I stammered. I go get him, and still having the time of her life. Manager came. Yeah, the machine costs money. Do you think all in life is for free? while scrutinizing my homeless looks of me, the Untermensch, meaning subhuman, in Swiss Nazi slang. As if it was normal, he said, here in Switzerland, using a counting machine cost 10 Swiss francs, which was exactly the amount plus 35 cents, which I had put into the machine which the smiling cashier lady must have known, but never told me, as it would have spoiled all the Swiss fun. So I had put 10 francs and 35 cents into the Swiss money machine, hoping to get a 10 Swiss francs bill to get myself some food. But instead of that, the Swiss money making machine absorbed all my food money, nothing left. Then, I literally exploded, feeling the blood rush into my head while seeing the smiling expression on their faces, making place for incredible despair. I quickly looked around what I could smash at that huge marble floor, which I already hated from the beginning, and saw nothing in that sterile place which I could grab and demolish until I saw that bank card machine just in front of me on the counter, and I grabbed it and wanted to pull it out of the wall. But the electric cable was that long that when going backwards into the middle of that sea of marble, the cable still hadn't reached the end. So by then I just smashed it in the middle of that marble floor with tiny pieces shattering in all directions and not a scratch on the marble. I immediately felt kind of relieved after having gotten rid of it and out of my system. And now it was my time to smile and look around with a satisfied look on my face while I met with anguish around me, totally changing the previous setup of them smiling and me not. Now it was me having the fun of my life while they were all docking behind the various counters. I quickly left the perimeter before getting trapped in that marble funeral bank. And although cell phones didn't exist yet 30 years ago, I decided it better to leave the damn country immediately. Funny though, 
how I made friends with the hateful marble floor in the end, assisting me in my endeavours to smash that bank card machine. A few hours later, back in France, with the entire local Swiss police force still looking for me over there, I nicked some French cheese in the nearest French supermarket, got myself a crunchy French baguette, crashed on a park bench, and thought by myself, vive la France. By the way, this is how the banks, how they make fun of homeless people. This is the HSBC Bank UK, the Templars colors or the Swiss flag, red and white. I suppose this is a, a daughter of the, of, of the Swiss banks anyway. Anyway, all banks in the world are Nazi Templar banks of uh, Switzerland. Eh? So this is how they make fun of homeless people. When a bus shelter is your only shelter, it's hard to open a bank account. Well, this is what I had to, what I realized as well. I mean, I couldn't open a bank account here in France because I need uh, three proofs of, you know, what, of my rent being paid. I need three proofs of my uh, of my job, the uh, the salary, three copies and a legal a, a, a valid pass, passport, etc., etc. And they're just making fun of it, you know. It's hard to open a bank account when a when a when a bus shelter is your only shelter. And this is their mindset of the banks. Eh? It's terrible. At least me, homie Ross, I didn't accept what when they stole my ten Swiss francs. Eh? I didn't accept it. Eh? No way. And. I realized very quickly when being in Switzerland that, you know, I didn't see any homeless people, you know, like sleeping out like this. And from what I heard many times, if they find homeless people, the Swiss, they call up the police and within an hour you're gone and they put you in a psych psychiatric ward in the boogie house. And uh, so this is why you don't see people sleeping out like this in Switzerland. So you be careful in countries where you don't see people sleeping out. Eh? Maybe it's horrible, like in London or in Paris, you see people sleeping out. But at least there is the freedom to do so. Okay. And here in this article, even in German, even the Swiss, they are moaning about it, that they need to pay for if you want to exchange coins. And it said in the article, like in the beginning, that the, uh, the, the, the lady at the counter here, Schalta, that means counter, said that it cost money. Well, me, they didn't even tell me anything. I didn't know. If I would have known, of course, I wouldn't, I, I would have dropped all the, the, the Swiss mountain of Swiss coins in the snack bar where I wanted to go, you know. But nobody told me, you know. They just wanted to make some fun out of a homeless. Because the Untermensch, the, um, the subhuman, the idea is very, very much alive in Switzerland. And Switzerland is, you know, where the Nazis stopped in 1945. It went on in Switzerland, eh? So, at least I didn't accept their cunning. Then, many years later, and this time in Zurich, again, I got harassed in a Swiss bank for nothing. Both times for nothing, you know, to just provoke problems all the time you know it's, it was very inviting they had statues uh, historical statues which i just wanted to film inside it would have taken me five seconds you know but uh they wanted to make a problem out of it eh? so you can see it here on wolf clan media i also got it in my channel but uh and there's the title swiss banksters call police and assault journalist sean ross so this is in Zurich, the financial center of Europe, where the Credit Suisse was uh, founded. 
on Monday 30th May 2011, Peter Odensov conducted an interview with a senior Swiss banker in Moscow, Russia. The banker explained that he had been involved in making a direct payment in cash to a professional assassin who had been contracted to kill the president of a third world country. The Swiss bank involved received a coded handwritten payment instruction from a foreign secret service. I can tell you the foreign secret service is called Octogon, the top of the Nazi Templars. This procedure was and is standard practice in the administration of Bilderberg initiated elite black ops. The Swiss banks concerned regularly receive such payment orders for contract assassination work. So here's the whole interview by uh, Peter Odinsov here. Revelations from a Swiss banking insider, Peter Odinsov, Noviden, Russia, Russian Weekly. Revelations from a Swiss banking insider by on June the 6th, 2011. And this is exactly the time when I also got arrested a few months before that. And at the end of 2010, they killed this Austrian um, guy who wanted to, who had a lot of intel on Swiss banks and he wanted to sell it and they murdered him. And when I talked about it in the Austrian newspaper, then uh, yeah, that was the end of me. So the interview with Peter Odinsov took place on May the 30th. That might have been the same day when they arrested me, eh? May the 30th. With the Russian weekly magazine Novi Den. Can you tell us something about your involvement in Swiss banking business? I have worked for Swiss banks for many years. I was designated as one of, of the top directors of one of the biggest Swiss banks. My guess is Credit Suisse. You know? They're highly criminal. During my work, I was involved in the payment, in the direct payment in cash to a person who killed the president of a foreign country. I was in a meeting where it was decided to give this cash money to the killer. This gave me dramatic headaches and troubled my conscience. It was not the only case that was really bad, but it was the worst. It was a payment instruction on order of a foreign secret service written by hand, giving the order to pay a certain amount to a person who killed the top leader of a foreign country. And it was not the only case. We, we received several such handwritten letters coming from foreign secret services, giving the order to pay out cash from secret accounts to fund revolutions or for the killing of people. I can confirm what John Perkins has written in his book, Confessions, of an economic hitman. There really exists such a system and Swiss banks are involved in such cases, right? Which me and my family, they had, we, we had to feel this, right? And Perkins book is also translated and available in Russian. Can you tell us uh, which bank it is and who was responsible? It was one of the top three Swiss banks. Well, that's Credit Suisse, UBS, no, I don't know the one, the other one. At that time, and it was the president of a country in the third world, but I don't want to give out too many details because they will find me very easily if I say the name of the president and the name of the bank. I will risk my life. You can't name any person in the bank either. No, I can't. But I can assure you this happened. We were several persons in the meeting room. The person in charge of the physical payment of the cash came to us and asked us if he is allowed to pay out such a big amount in cash to that person. And one of the directors explained the case and all others said, okay, you can do it. Did this happen often? Was this kind of a slush fund? Yes, this was a special fund managed in a special place in the bank where all the coded letters came in from abroad. The most important letters were handwritten. 
We had to decipher them and in them was the order to pay a certain amount of cash from accounts for the assassination of people funding revolutions, funding strikes, funding all sorts of parties. I know that certain people who are Bilderbergers were involved in such orders. I mean, they gave the orders to kill. Can you tell us in what year or decade this happened? I prefer not to give you the pre precise year, but it was in the 80s. So if I read this here in the 80s, it must be Thomas Sankara. Uh, there was a president, um, I think he was murdered in the 80s. A fantastic guy. He uh, really a fantastic Nubian president in the 80s. I'll look it up afterwards. Did you have a problem with this work? Yes, a very big problem. I couldn't sleep for many days and after a while I left the bank. If I give you too many details, they will trace me. Several secret services from abroad, most, mostly English speaking, gave orders to fund illegal acts, even the killing of people through Swiss banks. We had to pay on the instructions of foreign powers for the killing of persons who didn't follow the orders of Bilderberg or the IMF or the World Bank, for example. This is a very startling revelation that you are making. Why do you feel the urge to say this now? Well, there he is, Thomas Sankara, fantastic person. Thomas Isidore Noel Sankara, and he lived from, he died in 1987, so he died in the 80s. Was a Burkinabe military officer, revolutionary and pan-Africanist who served as president of Burkina Faso from his coup in 1983 to his assassination in 1987. Viewed by supporters as a charismatic and iconic figure of revolution, he's com commonly referred to as Africa's Che Guevara. Well, we can be pretty sure that this was the, uh, the one. Fantastic person, really. He would have done, he already did a lot of good for Africa and and uh, this guy was not corrupted at all. You can read it yourself. Uh, just punch pause. So all the good people, they get murdered. Eh? Uh, and the Swiss octagon, they are behind it. So you just punch pause if you want to read it all. Yeah, this is the things he did. Yeah, like, I remember this, you know, he sold off the government fleet of Mercedes cars and made the Renault 5, the cheapest car sold in Burkina Faso at that time, the official service car of the ministers. You know, he painted them black, you know, instead of a black limousine. They were like stuffed into a, a, a tiny French car, you know. <laughs> this is the kind of guy he was. Fantastic person. And of course, a person like this, you know, a, a person like that doesn't take any orders of any Swiss Nazi Templar banks, eh? By the octagon. So they had to, he had to go. I have a lot of respect for this man. And... In the interview, when they say the 1980s, I knew immediately it must have been Thomas Sankara. I have a lot of respect for this great Nubian. Too bad. So I repeat the last question. This is a very startling revelation that you are making. Why do you feel the urge to say this now? Because Bilderberg is meeting in Switzerland. Because the world situation is getting worse and worse. And because the biggest banks in Switzerland are involved in unethical activities. Most of these operations are outside the balance sheet. It's a multiple of what is officially declared. It's not audited and happening without any taxes. The figures involved have a lot of zeros. It's huge amounts. So it's billions. It's much more, it's trillions completely unaudited, illegal, and besides the, the tax system, basically it's a robbery of everybody. I mean, most normal people are paying taxes. Yeah, well, they robbed my bloody 10 Swiss francs, eh? 
<laughs> well, it's not a lot of zeros, but for me, it was a big zero. You know, I was being a homeless. I had at least one big zero after the one, eh? For a homeless, that's a big zero. And I mean, most normal people are paying taxes and abiding by the laws. Well, no. What is happening here is complete against our Swiss values. So it's a Swiss guy, eh? Uh, that's the problem with these Swiss. They they believe, you know, that they have values. They don't see that, you know, the laws that are the laws of the fair aristocracy they're ruling, you know. They just don't get it. And they all think they have to protect the Swiss banks, you know. Oh, you know, when I was living in that village you know, next to Bern, I got aggressed by neighbors, you know, because I dared as a foreigner, to criticize the Swiss banks. I mean, this is very rare, you know, a guy like this, uh, because he he, uh, he he saw the things going on, the evil things. But most people, they don't understand it. And all Swissies, they think they need to protect the Swiss banks and terrorize Homie Ross with his whole family because he Homie Ross dared to speak out in foreign newspapers and on YouTube. So what is happening here is complete against our Swiss values, like neutrality, honesty, and good faith. In the meetings I was involved in, the discussions were, uh, were, completely, were completely against our democratic principles. You see, most of the directors of Swiss banks are not locals anymore. They are foreigners, mostly Anglo-Saxon, either American or British. They don't respect our neutrality. They don't respect our values. They are against our direct democracy. They just use the Swiss banks for their illegal means. They use huge amounts of money created out of nothing, and they destroy our society and destroy the people worldwide just for greed. They seek power and destroy whole countries like Greece, Spain, Portugal, or Ireland, and Switzerland be will be one of the last in line. And they use China as working slaves and a person like Joseph Ackermann. Well, Joseph Ackermann, he was born actually uh, next to that big lake where, um, where the bees will rise. You remember that? I made that film of the, the seven hills or seven kings. And there is a town called Wallenstadt right there and this is where he where he was born so joseph ackermann who is a swiss citizen is the top man at a german bank and he uses his power for greed and doesn't respect the common people so this is wallenstadt you know this lake here where the the monster is supposed to uh, to rise from where the seven hills rules or seven kings are the seven Kurfürsten. It's the only place in the world what I found where the seven hills are seven kings, just as it says in the Bible. I haven't found any other place. So here are some people here who from there. Lucius Wildhaber, that was the, the first director um, of the um, the European Court of, of uh, Human Rights in Strasbourg. I mean, how can be how can a Swiss be the director in in the European Community of the Human Rights? Eh? And um, I dropped a complaint when he was still the uh, against Switzerland when he was still the uh, the director. Well, you want to know the result, eh? And. Um, Actually, he died after a visit with Putin. Well, you can see him here with Putin. A few weeks later, he died of a heart attack or something. Here, here he is, Joseph Ackerman, the guy, uh, the, the banker. And uh, the Swiss guard. And, uh, and there are a lot of other people. Even some Americans. Uh, the, there was a guy who was a uh, um, an admiral or something in the uh, an American admiral. I don't see him here. And this church here. 
uh, it's a it's a chapel of Saint George. Here it is on the mountain here. I don't think we oh yeah we can see it here. It's here on the mountain. And uh, Saint George was the uh, the the, the saint protector of the Knights Templars. So the Knights Templars were there where, where the beast is supposed to rise, where the bankers are. It's all there. Eh? And um, and this chapel was of uh, St. George was first mentioned in the year 1253. It's probably much older. And this is exactly the time of the, uh, of the Knights Templars. And it was the Knights Templars who... Uh, who founded the uh, the Swiss banks, the banking? You know, they founded this the check. They invented the check. So it's not a not a surprise. We found we find Joseph Ackermann in exactly that place. So here it is in German, Wallenstadt, as the the German edition is of course much more extended. So I'll, I'll just skip all this, eh? And um, so there are many more persons who are from Wallenstadt, but okay. Uh, here he is, Edward Walter Ebola, a U.S. American admiral. Well, he was born in Switzerland, eh? In, in Wallenstadt. As I told you, there are one million Swiss Americans in the U.S., who have taken over all key positions like presidents and admirals and and so forth. So I continue the interview here about uh, Joseph Ackermann and a person like Joseph Ackermann who is a Swiss citizen is the top man at a German bank and he uses his power for greed and does not respect the common people. He has quite a few legal cases in Germany and also now in the States, he's a Bilderberger and does not care about Switzerland or any other country. You see, they're all multinationals. And how come a Swiss from this very special place, he's the, the director of the, I think it's the biggest bank in the world, the Deutsche Bank, the German bank. And uh, in Frankfurt, of course, as I told you. Uh, well, because all banks, Actually, nowadays, all banks are actually Swiss Nazi Templar banks because they started it. Even all banks, all national banks, everything. I go on. Are you saying some of these people that you mentioned will be at the upcoming Bilderberg meeting in June in St. Morris? Oh, I went there. It was not in June. I think it was... Um, uh, I think it was in uh, April, yeah, or in May. I went there in 2011. Yes, so they're currently in a position of power. Yes, they have huge amount of money available and, it, uh, and use it to destroy whole countries. They destroy our industry and build it up in China. On the other hand, they opened up the gates in Europe for all Chinese products. The working population of Europe is earning less and less. The real aim is to destroy Europe. And this is what he's saying in, two, in the beginning of 2011. Right? Do you think that the Bilderberg meeting in St. Moritz has symbolic value? Because in 2009, they were in Greece, 2010 in Spain, and look what happened to them. Does this mean Switzerland can expect something bad? Yes. Switzerland is one of the most important countries for them because there is so much capital here. They are meeting there because apart from other things, they want to destroy all values that Switzerland stands for. You see, it's an obstacle for them, not being in the EU or Euro, not totally controlled by Brussels and so on. Well, you see, this is a Swissy, you know, they're completely brainwashed in Switzerland. Over the last 800 years, they are like dressed like a, like a, like a police dog, you know. And they really believe all this, this, what he's saying here, this Swissy, you know, that Switzerland is neutral and they have values and, 
and uh, he doesn't understand it. He just had a, a, a short glimpse as being a top banker, what uh, he saw some things he didn't like, you know. But all Swissies, they, um, they work with the system, you know. They're, they're very dangerous because they don't see it, yeah. They are very fanatic in protecting their clean and neutral Switzerland and very fanatic, you know. And uh, so regarding values, I'm not talking about the big Swiss banks because they're not Swiss anymore. Most of them are led by Americans. I'm talking about the real Swiss spirit that the common people cherish and hold up. You know, as soon in 1291, when the Knights Templars came and founded Switzerland, they put four peoples together and they made the Swiss product of, uh, I mean, a people comes with in one skin color and they come in one language. The, these are the, um, these are the facts concerning a people. I mean, I can't help it. I can't change it. This is how it is. And when they come in four languages, you know, that's not a people anymore. That's four peoples. Yeah. It's a product. And they immediately started to murder the, the good people in Switzerland. And they, they are bred. You know, it's a very dangerous, fanatic, bred product of the Knights Templars and the fair aristocracy. And this guy, he doesn't even, he doesn't see it because the Swissies, they've been bred for 800 years, you know, and they think it's okay, you know, to terrorize an immigrant like me and my, my Swiss family, my Swiss wife as well, because I, 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 um, I criticize the Swiss banks. And all Swiss, they're all bred, you know, fanatically to protect the Swiss banks. And only because this guy, he had a glimpse about not so, what the jaywalkers say, not so kosher things going on there. And he started thinking things, you know, normally the Swissies, they can't apprehend. They just can't. Sure, it has symbolic value, as you said, regarding Greece and Spain. Their aim is to be a kind of exclusive elite club that has all the power and everybody else is impoverished and uh, down. Do you think that the aim of Bilderberg is to create a kind of global dictatorship controlled by the big global corporations where there, where there are no sovereign states anymore? Yes, and Switzerland is the only place left with direct democracy. Well, there is no direct democracy because they have seven heads of state. And if they vote for something, it's not in their democracy or something, which is not direct. The seven heads of state, they're going to decide if the new law is going to be taken or not. And many, many laws, they, they were never executed anyway. So there is no direct democracy. And here you can see it again that the Swiss is, you know, so there is Pharaoh. And these Pharaoh, they kept like 50% um, good slaves, you know, peasants to work for them and all this. And they just don't see it, you know, because they're completely bred, indoctrinated over 800 years. It's probably the most indoctrinated, I can't say people, in the world. There's not much more indoctrinated. You know? They use the blackmail of too big to fail, as in the case of the UBS, to put our country in big debt, just like they did with many other countries. In the end, maybe they want to do with Switzerland what they did with Iceland, with all the banks in the country bankrupted. And also bring it into the EU, of course. The EU is under the iron grip of the Bilderberg. What do you think could stop this plan? Homie Ross, of course. Well, that's the reason I speak to you. It's truth. Truth is the only way. Well, that's what I always say, you know, information. Put a light on this situation, expose them. They don't like to be in the spotlight. We have to cre create transparency in the banking industry and in all levels of society. 
what you're saying is there is a correct side to the Swiss banking business and there are a few big banks that are misusing the financial system for their illegal activities. Yes, the big banks are training their staff with Anglo-Saxon values. I mean, this is typical Swiss, you know. Even if you see something going on which he doesn't like, this Swiss here, uh, he always put the blame on, on foreigners. Now it's the Anglo-Saxons, eh? They are training them to be greedy and ruthless, and greed is destroying Switzerland and everybody else. As a country, we have a majority of the most correct operating banks in the world. If you look at the small and mid-sized banks, it's just the big ones who operate globally. That are a problem. They are not Swiss anymore and don't consider themselves as such. Do you think it is a good thing that people are exposing Bilderberg and showing who they really are? I think the Strauss-Kahn case is a good chance for us because it shows, well, you remember the Strauss-Kahn case, that was his Frenchie, and he was definitely going to become France's president. And then he had this, uh, this rape case in New York, which of course, uh, nothing ever happened, you know. It's a good chance for us because it shows these people are corrupted, sick in their minds, so sick they are full of vices, and those vices are kept under wraps on their orders. Some of them, like Strauss-Kahn, uh, rape women. Others are sadomaso, sadomaso, or pedophile, and many are into Satanism. When you go in some banks, you see these satanic symbols, like in the Rothschild Bank in Zurich. Oh, I filmed that one, eh? Maybe you saw my video with all the lizards on it and all. These people are controlled by blackmail because of the weaknesses they have. They have to follow orders or they will be exposed so they will be destroyed or even killed. The reputation of Strauss-Kahn is not uh, only killed in the mass media, he could be killed also literally. Dominique Strauss-Kahn, eh? they say this, uh, the, you know, that he raped some servant girl, a Nubian servant girl in a rich New York uh, hotel. Well, it was probably a setup. Eh? Since Ackermann is in the steering committee of Bilderberg, do you think he's a big decision maker there? Yes, but there are many others like Lagarde, who will probably be the next IMF head also a member of Bilderberg, then Sarkozy and Obama. They have a new plan to censor the internet because the internet is still free. They want to control it and use terrorism or whatever as a reason. They could even plan something horrible so that they have an excuse. Now this is interesting. So this guy is already telling this before it happened. And right after, and it really started in 2015, so four years later with the terrorist attacks in Paris, um, it started the censorship on the internet, you know, on YouTube and all this. So he said it this year, four years before that. So, you know, it, it, this is a proof that this is a real interview with somebody who is not lying. Yeah. Um, so that is your fear. It's not only a fear, I'm certain of it. As I said, they give orders to kill. So they are capable of terrible things if they have the feeling they're also losing control, like the uprising now in Greece and Spain and maybe Italy will be next. Then they can do another Gladio you know, the Gladio um, scandal. Stay behind was the code name. I was close to the Gladio network. As you, uh, as you know, they in instigated terrorism paid by American money to control the political system in Italy and other European countries. Regarding the, num the murder of Aldo Moro, the payment was done through the same system as I told you about. 
Was Ackermann part of this payment system at the Swiss bank? Smile. You are the journalist. Look at his career and how fast he made it to the top. What do you think can be done to hinder them? Well, there are many good books out there that explain the background and connect the dots, like the one I mentioned by Perkins. These people really have hit men that get paid to kill. Some of them get their money through Swiss banks, but not only. They have a system set up all over the world and to expose the public, these people that are prepared to do anything to keep control. And I mean anything. Through exposure, we could stop them. Yes, telling the truth, we are confronted with really ruthless criminals, also big war criminals. It's worse than genocide. They are ready and able to kill millions of people just to stay in power and in control. Can you explain from your view why the mass media in the West is more or less completely silent regarding Bilderberg? Because there is an agreement between them and the owners of the media. You don't talk about it. They buy them. Also, some of the top media figures are invited to the meetings, but are told not to report anything they see and hear. Is the structure of Bilderberg in the structure of Bilderberg, is there an inner circle that knows the plans and then there is a majority who just follow orders? Yes. You have the inner circle who are into Satanism and then there are the naive or less informed people. Some people even think they're doing something good. The outer circle. According to exposed documents and own statements, Bilderberg decided back in 1955 to create the EU and the Euro, so they made important and far-reaching decisions. <clears throat> yes, and you know that Bilderberg was founded by Prince Bernard, a former member of the SS and Nazi party, and he also worked for IG Farben. And he studied in Lausanne, eh? You know this, Wissy, but you don't want to say it, maybe? I know it whose subsidiary uh, produced Cyclone B. Uh, the other guy was the head of Occidental Petroleum who had close relations to the communists in the Soviet Union. They work both sides, but really these people are fascists who want to control everything and everybody and who, and everybody and who gets in their way is removed. Is the payment system you explained outside of normal operation, com compartmentalized and in secret? In those Swiss banks, the normal employees don't know this is happening. It's like an own secret department in the bank. As I said, these operations are outside of the balance sheet with no supervision. Some are situated in the same building, others are outside. They have their own security and special area where only authorized people can enter. How do they keep this transaction out, out of the international SWIFT system? Well, some of the clear stream listings were true, were true in the beginning. They just included fake names to make people believe the whole list is fake. You see, they also make mistakes. The first list was true. And you can trace a lot of things. You see, there are people around that discover ir irregularities and the truth and they and they tell it. Afterwards, of course, there are lawsuits and these people are forced to shut up. The best way to stop them is to tell the truth. Put the spotlight on them. If we don't stop them, we will end up as their slaves. Thank you for this interview. Peter Odensov, uh, Noviden Info. So it's probably a Russian guy, maybe a Ukrainian. And this was in the very same time that uh, they arrested me with anti terrorist squad. So this is the same time as you can see here. This is in October 2010. And a few months later, in June. 2011, 
there was that interview which I just read to you about the the hitman working for the Swiss banks, you know, Credit Suisse, you know, and uh, and I was arrested a couple of months before the uh, one of the times uh, that time that came into the newspaper in uh, April two thousand and eleven. So this is in German. It only exists in German, and these these hitmen for the Swiss banks they murdered this guy. They put him in a Swiss prison, and in two weeks' time they he got suicided. I and I talked about it here. So here's my name, the historian Sean Ross. And here it says he gets It means he, he was suicided. The code O to T torture. I talked about it. And that was the end of me and my family. You know, my they ruined us. Now I've been on the run for eight years from Switzerland. So here's some more about it. And um uh, Exactly as Peter Odin saw in that interview, or actually the uh, the banker, how he um, how he explained it, uh, and I had Swiss police uh, try to murder me. They shot at me in the forest, and uh, yeah, so I I know that these things happen, and uh, it was a very truthful interview. So I show it once more. So that was exactly the same time, eh? So here's my name. There was in the Austrian newspaper called the Krone, the Krone Zeitung. Oh, here it says Krone Zeitung, Kronen Zeitung. Okay, here it says Kronen, and here it says Krone. Okay, that's why I mixed up. So and there were a lot of all the time I ended up in the Swiss newspapers, I already shown that to you. And so I'm not going to show it once more. And the authorities do nothing. And also the French authorities, they protect the Swiss banks, they protect the Swiss. I tried to drop a, a official complaint at the Justice Department three times. And as this guy was talking about it, that they were going to uh, use terrorism as a means to control the internet, I knew I, 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 when I infiltrated the Octagon group, they talked about this doing terrorist attacks in Berlin and uh, London and, uh, and Paris. So I tried to warn the French authorities, but uh, they didn't do anything. They all protect Switzerland and their banks and their huge pharmaceutical industries. They all protected. So I shouldn't have done it, you know. I mean, I, I thought I could open up my mouth, and as they portray this society as so free that we have all the freedom, you know. So it's their own fault, you know, that they portray this lie about our society because we're not free at all. It's a total dictatorship, people. So I'll read it for you. The Swiss beast world government. So this is inside the Swiss parliament. And you all see the Freemason checkerboard designs all over. And a lot of marmor as well, marble. And uh, this is the entrance. If you go out here, I think it's here just opposite of the uh, just opposite of the Swiss Parliament there is that Swiss uh, Credit Suisse bank with the marble floor and everything so it's sort of typically the same maybe the same architect well this is marble yeah and this probably as well but this is typical marble and inside that bank you know it it almost looks like 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 this here you know, it's all the same, the parliament, the, the government, the banks, the, the pharmaceutical industry, it's all the same, uh, the same beast. Yeah. 
so opposite here is right you know it's like it's just a few meters you know there is that bank where i smashed the um the uh, the machinery on the um on their fine marble floor because they they stole all the money i had you know? and the world is being ruled from out of switzerland remember bill cooper he said it as well and don't forget this interview by the by Peter Odensov. I wonder what he's doing today. Probably a Russian uh, journalist mm, on the good side. He probably fled. And uh, so now we know, you know, that uh, the Russians are very active in Africa with the Wagner Group. Are they are they the ones who executed uh, Thomas Sankara? in 1987 what they talked about what the, the swiss banker talked about i mean he he did give the interview in moscow didn't he right and i told you putin he's a swiss sleeper agent and the rest of his mafia guys you know and it's all out of the knights templars who founded the teutonic knights who ended up in the baltic where Putin was born in St. Petersburg, whereas the biggest castle in Europe, the Malbourg Castle of the Teutonic Knights, and this happened when the, um, the Knights Templars, who originally spoke French, they founded Switzerland and started to speak Swiss German and became the Teutonic Knights and the Swiss banks. The world is being ruled from out of Switzerland. The Swiss beast world government. In my video, the Swiss beast world government from last week, I explained to you how the Swiss Escher family from Zurich were slave drivers in the Americas who owned slave ships, got filthy rich in the textile industry through the cotton pickers and therefore needed a bank. So they founded the Swiss Nazi bank, Credit Suisse. And here's part two about this Swiss slave driver family from Zurich using concentration camp slaves, which the Nazis freely provided to the Swissies. Once a slave driver, always a slave driver. Switzerland is such a clean, neutral, and innocent country, aren't they now? And oni soi qui mal y pense, shame to those who think bad about it, like Homie Ross, who got destroyed by the Swissies because he thought bad about it. Oni soi qui mal y pense, the slogan and the motto of the infamous Order of the Garter that comes out of Swaziland and their Knights Templars and the new Knights Templar horizontal system. So here it says, Oni soi qui mal y pense, which is in Old French, and it means shame to those who think bad about it. So which is already a warning in itself. So for their very lucrative textile industry with totally free of charge cotton coming from their various slave plantations, making these lovely Swiss traditional clothes, Swiss nationalistic flags called Eidgenossisch and other Swiss wavery products 
like traditional Swiss folk folkloric costumes, Swiss traditional curtains, traditional Swiss beddings, all provided by the traditional Swiss slavery from the Americas. It needed, therefore, a wavery line. So, the Swiss slavery banking Nazi family Escher von Glas founded, therefore, in 1805 the Escher V's textile spinning factory by Hans Kaspar Escher together with Solomon von Weiss, the latter also being an aristocratic name with the von part in it. And also Escher's name is fully aristocratic because the full name of this Swiss dynasty is Escher von Glas. As in Switzerland, the long aristocratic names mostly disappeared because of the Knights Templars' horizontal rule, who founded Switzerland in 1291, making it the first and oldest New World Order democracy in the world. So, we're still talking here about that Escher family that founded the Swiss Nazi bank Credit Suisse that now went bankrupt because of their criminal transactions with Vladimir Putin, the Russian oligarchs, all sorts of mafiosi, crooked aristocrats, and the Swiss secret or Swiss secrets, huge banking scandal of February the 20th, 2022. So here it says Switzerland's traditional textile industry. So here you see a Swiss slave ship by the Escher family. And they're hanging up some Nubians who didn't want to obey, probably. And why should they obey to the Swissies? Me too, I didn't want to obey, yeah. And here you see this fabulous Swiss traditional clothing, the folkloristic Swiss clothing of the same era during the slavery times in the Americas. So these pictures here to the left and here to the right, it all fits together. When this was happening here, the Swissies, they had, they were wearing this sort of traditional folkloric clothes. Here you can see the Swiss flag, here you see this long Swiss flute in the Alps here. A little handbag, you know, like the pharaohs and the all, all these ancient pictures. They even have the little handbag, you know, as all pharaohs do, you know, which is quite a mystery, actually. So, well, this is lovely, neutral, innocent Switzerland, isn't it? And this infamous Escher family. So here is that company, Escher V's and Company from Wikipedia here. And uh, so remember Escher, that's the same family that founded this Swiss Nazi bank, um, Credit Suisse, and who was keeping slaves in the Americas. Right? So I'll read it for you here, history. The company was founded as Escher V's and Company in 1805 by Hans Kaspar Escher, there he is, and Salomon von Wies. After having originally started the company as a textile spinning business, as I just explained to you, the two expanded the enterprise to include a machine shop that manufactured textile machinery, water wheels, water turbines, 
power transmission equipment and starting in 1835 ships including boilers and steam engines. And here during World War II, about which later on I will explain you more, but I'll read this here so because I'm just having this uh, site here. So here the company also manufactured the hydraulic systems of hydroelectric plants. During World War II, the company was a supplier for the German war effort, manufacturing turbines for Norsk Hydro and supplying flamethrowers. Flame throwers. There you go. I will explain you more about it later on. And oh yeah, here it says, additionally, the comp company was an integral part of researching and developing turbines to produce heavy water for the creation of nuclear weapons for the Nazis. Okay, that's what Swissy and the family Asher was working on. Nuclear weapons and flamethrowers and whatnot. So there he is, that guy who founded the Escher Wies uh, company, yeah, Hans Kaspar Escher. And um, here he is, take a look at the picture. Look at his big and long nose, which is really aristocratic of the fair aristocracy, just as the huge nose of Pharaoh Ramses the Great, the, the biggest Pharaoh of all times, or King Louis the Fourteenth. If you look at profile of Louis the Fourteenth, you'll see the same thing. So it's not the jaywalkers with noses like that. And if they have it, some jaywalkers, then it means they are from the jaywalker nobility. You know, like Rothschild and Baron von Rothschild and this uh, the guy who had this castle and uh, who um, who had um, Hermann Göring living in his castle, the uh, the big fat Nazi. Eh? And sometimes jaywalkers just have big nose like this, but it's very rare. If they just have the um, the genetics through rape by the pharaohs, eh? just as they did with the Europeans. So the aristocracy always have these long noses. Putin has it as well. Just go and have a look, you know. And just have a look at the physics, you know. So it says here, it, I could only find it in German, but it doesn't matter. I'll translate it for you. So here it says the the Escher, this family, comes out of the family here, Escher from Glass. And as you can already see, I sh I'll show it a little bit more later. Uh, this is the nobility. Uh, the, you know, all these double names, Escher from Glass. You know, they have a coat of arms, a crest. So this is the nobility, and because Switzerland became a horizontal rule, you know, they sort of disappeared, you know, they, they kept a low profile, the whole aristocracy, and um, it seems that they just uh, tended, you know, to get, you know, normal names, you know, like Escher here, and just leaving the rest, like here, from, from Glass, you know. And he uh, founded the uh, that company um, uh, here, Escher Wies, uh, about which I just um, talked about here, together with the banker. Here it says the banker, Bankier, that means banker in Germany, in German, Salomon von Wies. That's another aristocrat with the von part, like here. So this means, you know, as I've been telling you. The whole banking industry, all the big companies, slavery, you name it, Nazism, it's all in the hands of the aristocracy. And the aristocracy, they come from Pharaoh. I mean, I'm giving you all the proofs here. They're all, they're all from the nobility. They all got these double names with Von, Von. They're, they're keeping the, the world's biggest Nazi banks like um, uh, Credit Suisse. They're working with the Nazis on the atom bomb and everything, keep slavery. They have kept the European peoples, the white race, for, into slavery for the last 2,000 years by the Romans and, and by the, the feudal system, by the kings. They did the same thing with the Nubians, with the American Indians, only the American Indians, you know, they, they just kept on hunting and they, they just ran away. 
Uh, they, they, they just they they couldn't use them for slavery, you know. They did the same thing with the Chinese, with with all of us, you know. Well, of course, with the Jaywalkers who were the first who were kept in slavery. So we must understand all this. What I'm explaining to you all here. So, and here's the other guys, Solomon von Wies, with whom the other guy uh, here, Hans Kaspar Escher, Escher von Glas, with whom he founded this um, very dangerous um, uh, Nazi company working on the atom bomb and, and a wavery, you know, with all the, uh, the stolen cotton using slaves and all that, you know. And it says here, you know, he was also in politics. They were really high up in politics. Just like the Salomon von Wies here, it says. He was in politics here, the Kantonsrat, the Großrat here. Rat, it means the, um, the council, you know, uh, very high positions. And the name von, it's, as I just told you, it means it's the nobility. And... Salomon, that's the German word for Solomon, King Solomon. And who was King Solomon? Was he a normal jaywalker? King of the jaywalkers? No, of course not. He was a king, for God's sake. He was the son of King David, like the, um, the savior starting with a J, who's going to save us all. He's coming down from the cross. He's going to save us all. And he's also from the house of David. You know, they all are eh? promising us things for 2000 years and never keeping a, a word. So don't hope too much on it, people. And King Solomon, it says in the Bible, he was married with the daughter of Pharaoh, right? So this guy, he, he's from the nobility. And so was Solomon, King Solomon. They're all pharaohs, and that's why he took the name of most likely one of his ancestors, right? Anyway, the nobility comes out of pharaoh. So I think this is a direct line out of pharaoh. And Wies, that's Swiss German, for the German word Weiss. And Weiss, it means white. So this means he's from the white house people the perhet of pharaoh of upper egypt who are more into the horizontal rule whereas the red house the original aristocracy they are more in the feudal vertical rule so and this is why he had a big position in the republic because that's horizontal here yeah, Großrat. so von wies it means Solomon from the White House or Solomon from the Per Hat. Just like the White House in America, in Washington, D.C., and America became the biggest horizontal New World Order rule in history and in the entire world. So it's all connected. Von Wies, vom Weißen Haus, yeah. Hat sie das verstanden alle, ja? Auch ihr Schweizer, Wies, ne? Ist ja Schweizerdeutsch, ja? And so here I could, again, only found, find it in German, um, but it doesn't matter. I will translate it for you. So you're all lucky that I can translate the German to you because you won't find this anywhere else on the internet, right? Not even in German. So Escher, it's from the, the, the bloodline dynasty Escher vom Glas, which is the aristocracy, which you can see here. There's a coat of arms. And remember how he had this, um, together with his friend Solomon von Weiss, um, they founded this very dangerous uh, company about which i tell you more later on. So coming back to Solomon, King Solomon, here we see the seal of Solomon. It's not the jaywalker thing. It is the, um, it's also the symbol of the JJ base. I explained to you in um, Brighton what that means because I can't use the word for this. 
This is where the, the jaywalkers, where they have their center in the Middle East. Uh, this is how I can describe it. And these little dots on it here, and it's also here, it means it's uh, drops of blood. And this, this jar here, it's the grail, which I've, I've explained to you in my film, my first video, The Pharaoh Show. Though this means these blood drops here in the jar, they come out of the bloodline of King Solomon. That's why Solomon von Wies, who was a friend of this um, Asher from Glass. So again, this is the coat of arms of Asher from Glass. Here we got the two pillars, uh, Yashin and Boaz, um, of the temple, which also belong to King Solomon. Here, again, his, his, uh, the uh, star is the, um, uh, the, the star of, uh, of King Solomon. And here, in the temple of King Solomon in Jerusalem, there were the two pillars, Yashin and Boaz. Well, here they are. Eh? It's all here. Eh? And, and here you've got this, uh, I think, oh, here, Heinrich Escher, 1685, from the family Escher. See, here already, the name von um, Glass, it's already gone. And here, look, here you got this pharaonic um, thing here. And you got this ring, a signet ring on his little finger to transmit an information, what the nobility always do. And this is like uh, what I explained you, King Solomon. You know, they got this royal, um, I, I don't recall the name. And look at his nose. You know, Europeans don't have noses like this. This is pharaonic. There's another pharaoh, you know, with a big bump here on top of it, just like Pharaoh, Ramses the Great, and, and all of them, right? all of them. So, and here, well, we already seen this. This is uh, Hans Kaspar Escher, who founded the um, that uh, Nazi factory, Escher Wies. Very dangerous people. So I come back to this site uh, later on. Explain you that they have a lot of branches, you know, like here, Escher von Lux, and Escher von Binningen, here, here von Binningen. It's all Asher, and they're everywhere. It says, they're also in the USA. They're all over people. I've been telling you, there are one million Swiss Americans in the US, and they, uh, they rule the country. This extremely powerful Swiss Asher from Glass dynasty belongs to Pharaoh's aristocracy, also called the Pharistocracy from Pharaoh's aristocracy. And they are already cited in historical documents in the year 1190, when a Jacob Escher was in official service of the Counts of Habsburg, against whom in that year of 1291, the Knights Templars waged a war using Swiss peasants, whom they had trained militarily with crusader techniques and taking over the Habsburg vertical rule and founding Switzerland with its horizontal rule in the year 12. 91 and just two and a half months after the crusades so here it says templar base and this is the swiss flag which almost looks like a swastika in the same colors of the knights templars red and white and here it says death dealers which they basically are from the moment onwards a family has many branches and thus becoming very powerful. It is called a dynasty, which is the case with Escher from Glass, who have a branch called Escher from Lux. And in the 14th century, Heinrich Escher from Glass 
married first with Margareta zum Tor, another aristocratic name. And after that, he married with Regula Manessa von Manek, also of the nobility, with those long double names and the German von Part in between, indicating its nobility. The Basler branch from Basel, where the Bank of International Settlements is, for instance, so the Basler branch became Asher von Binningen, which is called the Daig, meaning the Dau in Swiss German. As this aristocracy sticks together as the Dau. And if you pull the Dau, it will bounce back to where the whole lump is. And Gervasius Escher von Binningen became in 1655 Freiherr von Umkirch und Hoffenheim. Now, that really sounds aristocratic, does it now? From the beginning, of the 17th century, the Escher vom Glas nobility split up into three bloodlines. One, the Pfauen Escher bloodline, two, the Heinrich Escher bloodline, and three, a French Escher bloodline by Hans Jakob Escher Ram. And later on, the Pfauen Escher and the Heinrich Escher bloodlines again split up into like a virus multiplying itself by splitting up into all <coughs> the time. So here it says Escher vom Glas, nobility. It's a Swiss dynasty with slave drivers and Nazi bankers. So here you can see the textile industry. Here's the coat of arms. And this is what they did with people. And not only with Nubians, also with jaywalkers, with the Europeans and whatnot, also in the Americas. Just like the Swiss pharmaceutical companies as I already explained to you, they are extremely dangerous and extremely powerful. And this is not the real faces of um, the octagon in the Alps. Forget this, eh? This here to the right, this is their real face and what they're doing. And this here is where they come from. And the Swiss is actually, they are like police dogs, you know, they're very good trained. They always, you know, I'm talking about the Swiss people, you know, the peasants. They're like police dogs. They're trained to protect their Swiss banks. And uh, they think it's clean and neutral and they're really fanatic and um, really fascist ideas. And as soon as you've got another idea, even if you give all the proofs like Homie Ross, then you're gone, you know, because the Swiss police dogs, they protect their masters who are here in the middle. And if you say one wrong word, you end up upside down like the Nubian here or like they did with Homie Ross and his entire family. So here is what I just told you about all the branches of the Escher vom Glas. And here they were the Counts of Habsburg. And in 1190, they talk about Jacob Escher. And uh, here, Escher from Lux, typical nobility. And he married with, uh, or Escher from Glas here. They, and uh, Heinrich, he married first with. Um, Margareta Tumtor, another 
nobility, and then he married with Regula Manessa von Manegg, again the nobility. This is all pure nobility. And here they talk about Escher von Binningen in Basel, where the Bank of International Settlements is, and they became the dyke, about which I, I'll tell you more in a moment. And here they be he became uh, Freiherr zu Umkirch und Hoffenheim in the 17th century. Yeah, Rudolf Hescher, he was the Herr zu Dübelstein. You know, the Steinsies, they, they, they are the, Stein, the stone builders, right? And um, um, Escher Rahn, Jacob Escher Rahn, and uh, to Kuburg, Escher Wertmüller. They're all politicians, you know, they're all ruling, you know. Here, Konrad Escher von der Lind, nobility. Here, the famous Heinrich Escher and the, Alfred Escher, the one who founded the Swiss bank uh, Credit Suisse. And here, the company Escher Wies. And here you can see they were everywhere, you know, and more than they say. There's just the tip of the iceberg. Zurich, Bern, Italy, the north of Italy, it says here, France, Austria, Germany, and the US of A. Together with von Grafenried, of course, who even Laura Bush, she is a descendant of von Grafenried out of Switzerland, which I already explained to you 12 years ago. So it's all in here, in German. Unfortunately, not in English, but you can just, you know, uh, copy paste and put it in the uh, the Google translation machine if you want to have it for yourself. And it, I mean, it's all here, you know, extremely ruthless families. They are, I mean, they're all based in Switzerland. So here is the Daig. In Swiss German, it means the Dow. Yeah, while Dow, a uh, Daig literally means Dow in Swiss German. And um, so I read it here for you. Daig is an expression common in Basel, and most people don't even know it. And the Deutschschweiz, and refers to a milieu consisting of wealthy families like Escher von Binningen from the Swiss city of Basel. These families had full civic rights. So, I mean, here we we come to the origins of the Bank of International Settlements. Eh? In the then city-state since the High Middle Ages and are known for their particular idiosyncratic habits and a dialect distinct from that of the rest of the population. For, you know, the nobility, they're talking a little bit like that, yeah. For centuries, the dyke was a social, political, and economic elite of Basel, although it remained closed off from the outside world. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I'll let you read it yourself. And Basel is very, very powerful. I mean, the Bank of International Settlements are there. I'm not going to read it all for you, you know. So here, one of the defining characteristics of the dyke milieu is its perceived need to separate itself from those not part of that milieu. This separation is intended to distance Basel's aristocracy both vertically from the middle classes as well as horizontally from the so-called newly rich. So it's not really for them to be to be part of the dike. So being rich, the money is not the ingredient or the important uh, factor. The important factor is the bloodlines. And this is why they vertically, they seek their distance from the so-called newly rich, you see. They're just pure pharaohs. Pharaoh's nobility, the pharistocracy people. And I, I mean, the proofs are all here. Eh? So here you can see the Rhine in Basel. This is the Roche Tower. 
the ones who had the PCR machines ready just before the um, the pandemic. You know, they just needed a little pandemic, a global one, right, to get filthy, filthy rich, which they did. They got filthy rich. You know, they had two twenty four billion which they gained through the, at least, and um, much, much more, you know, to buy their own factory back, you know, from Novartis. And they're all next to each other, you know, it's, not, it's one company. And this tower is really awful, you know, it, it really breaks up the, the skyline, you know, of a, of a medieval town. It's really horrible. I mean, the, the people probably don't even like it, you know, the people there. But, uh, what do you do against the dike? Yeah. So that means the Dow. You know, if you pull the Dow, you know, it ding, you know, like a like a rubber. It just it just goes back. Or like some alien sort of thing, you know. They found these metals, you know, area what is it, fifty one or something. They found these metals who just bounce back and they say, yeah, well, it was a weather balloon. Yeah, yeah, sure it was, yeah. The dyke people, especially the Swiss. Yeah, there are other languages. So uh, probably, yeah, it's also in German here. So here it is in German. Go go ahead and read it, Swissies. So this Escher von Glas, Swiss aristocratic dynasty, is a real conglomerate, just like the Swiss Holderman dynasty, about whom you can find out in these videos that were censored by YouTube and to be seen here on Brighton. Remember Bob Holderman, the main instigator of the Watergate scandal, leading to the indictment and consequent impeachment of US President Richard Nixon and orchestrated by a bunch of very powerful Swiss families of the Swiss dyke conglomerate spreading its claws all over the world and in this case all over the United States. So here's part one. Switzerland's powerful Holderman dynasty descendant Elon Musk, Anagram Lonescom. Oh. On my channel, Gure on uh, Brighton. And here, part two Switzerland's powerful Holderman dynasty with Swiss Bob Holderman creating Watergate scandal by Planet of the Alps. So here's the channel. Here you can see Bob Holderman. And here you can see the other Holderman descendant, Elon Musk, from his mother's side. And of course, you can be sure that this Asher from Glass dynasty, who are in the US, that they're also part of this uh, conspiracy, the Watergate conspiracy behind Bob Holderman. And of course, we had uh, J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI, I think at the same time, there was the CIA, Alan Dulles uh, from a Geneva family. Um, they're all behind it, people. Very powerful dynasties. And it all comes out of the Knights Templars, who were part of the fair aristocracy, and their base is Swaziland. So here is my Brighton channel here it says Brighton free uh, freedom to speak and here is the name Gure and then here again Gure I've got a lot of subscribers 273 <laughs> it's not very much the uh, the icon is a cat with an enormous shadow of a lion so be aware of the cat eh? you never know and then you just scroll down you know, there's a lot of deleted videos like this one for the New Zealanders and the Australians going out and see it. Also deleted and much, much more deleted. And just scroll down and okay, there we are, Bob Holderman. There he is. And here are the other Holderman. Do they look alike? Well, the ears are the same. Look the same ears and all that. Mm, yeah. 
I should make a video about it and may have a closer look. Maybe I'll do that one of these days. And there are many more videos. Um, here, browse all videos. Okay, there we go. And um, here, number two. There are some more deleted videos here of mine. Uh, like this one was deleted. This here is deleted. This got deleted here. This got deleted. This one got deleted. So it's my uh, where my channel with a um, where I put a lot of deleted videos. I couldn't find them all anymore. Most of them are lost. But anyway, go and have a look at the Holdemans. In the 19th century, there was Escher von der Lind bloodline or branch. And just look at that big and most of all long pharaonic aristocratic nose, like Pharaoh Ramses the Great or King Louis the Fourteenth, the Sun King. The branches of this dangerous Swiss dynasty have also infiltrated Italy, France, Austria, Germany and the US where they have rooted and taken key positions in society. One of this dynasty by the name of Felix Escher vom Glas was even called the politician of the aristocrats. They had their own politicians. Well, I mean, all politicians, all aristocrats. You know. So this one here, I already showed it to you before, is Hans Konrad Escher von der Lindt. And look at the nose. This is King Louis XIV, the Sun King. And this is a mummy of Ramses the Great. Look at his hair. You know, he's a ginger. All these pharaohs, all these mummies, they, they, got, they got ginger hair, you know. So, and look at this big nose and so long, you know, very long. If, if you imagine with all the, the flesh on it, you know, it's, it's and this one too, big, you know. And it doesn't stop here. Normal people, you know, Europeans, you know, it's, there's this going in here, you know, and then you've got the nose. But this goes all the way, like a bridge. It goes all the way straight, you know. And look at the skull here. It's it's like, what is it, 45 degrees going backwards. And this one too. And the same nose, you know. It's, it's the same dynasty. And, and look at the eyes here and here. This is the aristocracy. And their base is Switzerland, like here, Escher vom Glas. And this is their branch, uh, Escher von der Lindt. They got the same faces, they got all key positions, politicians, one crime after the other. Uh, these are our masters. So here, once more, there's a website here, Escher vom Glas. And here is this. Uh, guy again, I just showed him. He's got the same profile as King Louis the Fourteenth, the Sun King. The same nose and profile as um, Pharaoh Ramses the Great. And um, so this is the bloodline, as you can read here, Escher von der Lindt. And um, so here's the whole. Again, the whole picture. And look at the eyes. It, it looked also very similar to Louis the Fourteenth, and the the angle of his uh, of his of his front here. You know, normally, you know, Europeans, it's like this. You know, going like up, like you know, not like bent like that or in an angle. So. And here was the other one, Felix Escher vom Glas. And here it says, Politiker der Aristokraten, 
a politician for the aristocrats or and of the of the aristocrats you know they don't do these things anymore you know it's 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 so obvious but they tried these sort of things you know like in the 19th century and uh well this is more like the 18th century and uh it's probably not a good strategy you know it get, things are getting too obvious so in, the, in these days they still did it you know no that would be too obvious and they you know they want to hide all their things you know and here one more time the coat of arms yashin boas the jar the the grail where the blood is in there even blood drops here and the um the star of uh the seal of solomon so that means the blood of solomon in here it's so obvious so here you can see the whole page of hans konrad escher von der lind and here is the crest of um, hans konrad escher which is almost the same you know you got the same grail with these blood drops on it but it, the other one looked more like blood drops and the seal of solomon which is going into the grails meaning um th this is where they come from you know king solomon a pharaoh married with the daughter of pharaoh i mean they betrayed themselves with their coat of arms and their crests and all that and um there he is again this is when he was older you know you know the the it's, the nose it's going straight you know into the skull here you know it's not going the nose like here in and then back here no it's just one it's like a bridge you know? and they all have this you see this look same nose like um king louis he even got coins and all that oh isn't that clean you know here are the uh this is probably the um uh, these are the seven hills i told i told you about the kurfürsten in the in the um in the end times the apocalypse of john there were the seven um, hills there are also seven kings and kurfürsten that is a king so you know these are the masters and then they got like 50 percent probably um voltaire he said once you know 50 percent of the swiss they live in paradise and the other fifth 50 percent they live in hell and um so the masters they live in paradise and the uh the, the dumb slaves they live in hell and uh so but the swiss the people the dumb slaves you know they they're like police dogs you know they 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 will always protect their masters and the system their banks their incredible criminal pharmaceutical companies um nazism slavery the the swiss police dog people they they are trained you know over 800 years being dominated by by these pharaohs and by the Knights Templar, the Knights Templar system, with the Oni Soit qui mal y pense. Um, yeah, the, this this is definitely all the, um, the 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 Seven Hills stuff. Oh yeah, it says Eshero. Hmm. Oh. okay the masters so look at the profiles look at the noses you know it's the same as pharaohs and the and the big kings of the uh, feudal system so the aristocratic Escher from glass dynasty of pharaohs nobility in Switzerland 
are the founders of that very powerful and very criminal Swiss Nazi bank called Credit Suisse. And this pharistocratic dynasty were also slave drivers in the Americas, as Pharaoh's nobility has always been into slavery. As I told you so all the time, that Pharaoh's nobility are the ones behind the Swiss Nazi banks, as the Knights Templars who founded banking and Switzerland come out of the nobility and were all sons of French aristocrats. So this is what is called a, this engraving from ancient Egypt is called a petroglyph. So the hieroglyphs are the letters and the words and the images are, are the petroglyphs like this one here. So this is when he was alive, this one here. So this is a depiction of Ramses the Great when he was alive. So look at this nose, you know, when he was alive, which is exactly the same as Louis, uh, Louis the Fourteenth, the Sun King, and also the the skull, you know, like having an angle, you know, like forty-five degrees almost, going like this, you know, and not like up like or a little bit like that, you know. Um, so ancient Egypt, ancient Egypt, and here in Europe, they conquered us a couple of thousand years later, <laughs> still the same ones. And here it says, of course, pharistocracy, the aristocracy from Pharaoh. It's still the same, nothing has changed. And it gets even worse. What this Escher vom Glas pharistocratic dynasty has perpetrated during World War II. So that Swiss Escher Wies company, founded by the all powerful Escher vom Glas dynasty in the year 1805 with machines for the textile industry to wave the cotton from the Americas obtained by slavery, was during World War II a Nazi company using concentration camp inmates for their Swiss factory in Ravensburg from the infamous Buchenwald concentration camp. Us again, Swissy, using slave labor, just as in the old days, during the cotton picker days in the Americas, making Swissy extremely wealthy. It seems that neutral, clean, and innocent Switzerland uses slave labor whenever they can. Slave labor is good for business, is the Swiss motto. So here it says, famous Swiss motto, slave labor is good for business. So I'll read it for you here. Switzerland's contract kids, Swiss slave children. Look, the poor kids don't even have shoes on. They did the same with their own Swiss children as they did with the Nubians in the America, you know, slavery with the cotton pickers. And as they did with concentration camp uh, people, prisoners, also slaves. And as you know, by now, the Swissies had even hundreds of thousands of their own children enslaved, called the contract kids or die Verdinkinder in Swiss German. Just look it up. Uh, I'll show it to you. I've experienced these Swissies 
as a soulless product by Pharaoh, and they are not a real people, because a people comes in one skin color and one language only, and not like the Swiss in four different languages. The criteria and characteristics of a people are that they have one national language in common and only one skin color. And this is not me who invented this. This is official. These are the criteria that make a people. <laughs> I cannot change it. Eh? Therefore, the Swissies cannot be a people, but they are a product put together by their masters who rule the whole country after they founded it in 1291. So here are the, the children slaves. Here it says children slaves, Pharaoh's Swiss product. This, this is how they make a product. You know. The poor kids don't even have shoes. And these were, this is probably from the 50s, you know, when there were cameras. Can you imagine like in this 19th century and all that, you know. And who ruled Switzerland in those days of the Swiss slave children, which lasted until 1989. Yes, the slave driver families. Escher from Glas, the Dyke dynasties, the Haldeman dynasty, etc., who are, of course, also responsible for this tragedy here. It's time to stop him, people. So here it says the Haldeman dynasty and Escher from Glas dynasty. Oh, there are, and there are many, many others. So in the same time, when they did this in the Americas, you know, with the Nubians, and when they did it in the Second World War with the jaywalkers and concentration camp inmates, don't you think they are the same ones who, were, who took these slave children here? Eh? And look at their faces. They don't, these children don't look happy at all, eh? They, they grew old very quickly. You know, the, this same hard-faced faces like in concentration camps, you know. So here you can read about it in English. Verdinkinder, it says, contract children. Were children in Switzerland who were taken from their parents. And, uh, but, you know, the, this here is is in quite very civilized speech here, you know, and it's it's barely scratching the surface, you know, as usual in Switzerland. It's probably censored, you know, all the time, yeah. And, um, and the funny thing is, you know, even many of these children's slaves, they would always um, protect the Swiss system and protect Switzerland and... Uh, protect the Swiss banks and the, and the whole the, the whole the whole Nazi thing you know which is they're completely indoctrinated and brainwashed and um, there's not much to do about these you know it's um, it needs a reset yeah let's say a positive reset. This here is a genuine color picture from 1941, where you see a German in Russia burning the, down the houses in, in, of civilians with a Swiss flamethrower by Escher Wies. So it says Swiss flamethrowers burning Russian civilians alive. And the Swiss Nazi company Escher Wies manufactured flamethrowers for the genocide on the Russian people, burning down Russian villages with the people inside. And in fact, 
Operation Barbarossa got financed by the Swissies in 1941 with 1 billion Swiss francs at the time, which is trillions of dollars today. And WDR, I show that in a minute, is Westdeutsche Rundfunk and is one of the main German state TV stations with serious information. So I guess with those 1 billion Swiss francs, a lot of Swiss made flamethrowers were bought to burn the Ruskies and their children alive. Which actually happened like that, killing 27 million Russians in World War II by the Nazis. And this is the true essence of Switzerland. And the incredibly criminal Escher from Glass dynasty. And just think about that for a moment, how Vladimir Putin, the actual president of Russia, is doing business with the Escher from Glass dynasty and their Credit Suisse bank, while that same Swiss family made the Nazi flamethrowers to burn Russian civilians and their children alive. Just think about that for a moment and realize how distorted it all gets concerning this neutral, clean, and innocent pharaonic base in the Alps. So here you see the poor Russian woman here, everything burning, everything down. Here the Germans here with their Swiss flamethrowers, everything burning down. So here it says Swiss flamethrowers for the genocide on the Russians. So here it says WDR and here a one. So that's the first German television, the Westdeutsche Rundfunk the uh, West uh, German uh, uh, radio uh, broadcast or the West German broadcast, yeah, radio broadcast. And here you see those Swiss helmets here, the uh, Swiss here in the, in the Alps uh, with Swiss rifles, they're fairly good. And um, the article is in German, but um, You'll understand. So here it says that Hitler in 1941 for the Operation Barbarossa, he got 1 billion Swiss francs. Eine Milliarde, that's 1 billion Schweizer Franken, Swiss francs. He got that for, uh, for the Russian uh, campaign, the uh, Russland Feldzug. So, if you want to read the whole article, you know, you can, um, if I won't forget, I'll put it in the link, in the links. I put the link in the description and you can run it through the, uh, through the Google Translate. So, there, there's a lot more to see here. Yeah, also, on February 23rd in 1937, uh, the Swiss, they promised Hitler that uh, Switzerland would never attack Germany. So he had all his, his hands free to do whatever, you know. And that's because of the banks, you know, uh, Credit Suisse, um, family, the dynasty, Escher Wies, Escher from, from Glass. Escher Wies was the, uh, the company. And uh, criminal, very criminal. So, I mean, this... German, the first German broadcast here, State TV. I mean, they're serious, you know. Uh, not everything is bad. I mean, I don't like media very much. But this is not so much like um, 
you know, the media with a lot of, um, how should I put it? Um, oh, I can't find the word really. Uh, but, you know, they've got, they got more like serious programs, you know, about, you know, history and um, uh, they're fairly good. Uh, I mean, this is really good. What's here? So here it says February 23rd, 1937. Um, and I was the other way around. So Hitler, he guarantees the neutrality of Switzerland. So, okay. So the Swiss had their, their hands free, yeah. Additionally, the Swiss aristocratic factory, Escher Wies, by the aristocracy of the Escher von Glas and Solomon von Wies nobility, was helping the Nazis to create the Nazi atom bomb by the manufacturer of turbines for Norsk Hydro, who were making heavy water in Norway needed for the Nazi nuclear weapons. Interesting enough, my grandfather, who was an officer in the British naval intelligence during World War II, possibly helped to destroy the Norsk Hydro plants in Norway, as naval intelligence worked closely together with the SOE for Special Operations Executive and 30 AU Assault Unit. But I'm not sure, because he died in 1942 under very suspicious circumstances. Interesting, though, that 80 years later and two generations later in my family, his grandson is still dealing with this very same enemy in the form of the Escher Wies Swiss Nazi company. So here you see the bomb. Yeah, Mr. Hitler, and here it says Escher Wies, Swiss made. And this guy, he was a Swiss sleeper agent financed by the first, uh, by the Swiss general Ulrich Weller Jr., who came out of the German high nobility of uh, von Bismarck. His mother was a von Bismarck. It's always the fair aristocracy all over. And guess who was the CEO director of Escher V's Swiss Nazi company in Ravensburg? Answer, the father of Klaus Schwab by the name of Eugen Wilhelm Schwab where this incredibly dangerous Swiss family was already busy in the great Nazi reset, trying to make the Nazi atom bomb and resetting Nazi concentration camp inmates until their death by exhaustion and whatnot. The ancient connection between the Escher family and the Klaus Schwab family establishes all the proofs that we're dealing here with a conglomerate who are executing a genuine long-time conspiracy against mankind. And this pharaonic conglomerate conspiracy always operates from out of their base in the Alps, Switzerland. The grandmother of Klaus Schwab, by the name of Marie Lappert, was born in Kirchberg, Switzerland. And the mother 
of Klaus Schwab by the name of Erika Ebrecht was also Swiss. And here it says the Swiss connection because this guy here, he was a Swiss sleeper agent financed by the Swiss. And this one here, Swiss. So the Swiss connection. So some information once more on Klaus Schwab. And Schwab was born to Eugen Wilhelm Schwab and Erika Ebrecht in Ravensburg. You see how near it is to the Swiss border. Just. His parents had moved from Switzerland to Germany during the Third Reich in order for his father to assume the role of director at Escherwies AG, an industrial company and contractor for then Nazi Germany. So that was the company his father, Eugen Wilhelm Schwab, was uh, the director of, about which I just told you a couple of things. So you can read it here yourself. Oh, look, he's a Knight Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George. Uh, this, you know, St. Michael is the, this, the, the same protector of the Mafia and St. George is the same protector of the, um, of the Knights Templars. And this is what the British Royal House, they have um, on their breast. You know. He's got a lot of things here. Oh, here in French, but it doesn't matter. You can, you can read the names here because it, it wasn't in the English uh, section. Here it says his father, Eugen Schwab, whom I just mentioned, is the son of Gottfried Schwab. And the Swiss, Swisses, it means Swiss, Marie Lappert, born in Kirchberg in 1875. And his mother, sa mère, Ella Suisses Erika Ebrecht, is the Swiss Erika Ebrecht. So it's, it's all Swiss. Oh, extremely dangerous. Very powerful conglomerate and uh, dynasty. Here, I read it for you here. In the pre-war years of the 1930s leading up to German annexation of Poland, Ravenburg's Escherwies factory, there we go, now managed directly by Klaus Schwab's father, Eugen Schwab, continued to be the biggest employer in Ravensburg. Not only was the factory a major employer in the town, but Hitler's own Nazi party awarded the Escher Wies Ravensburg branch the title of National Socialist Model Company, while Schwab was at the helm. The Nazis were potentially wooing the Swiss company for cooperation in the coming war, and their advances were advances were eventually reciprocated. Ravensburg was an anomaly in wartime Germany as it was never targeted by any Allied airstrikes. The presence of the Red Cross and a rumoured uh, agreement with various companies, including Escher Wies, saw the Allied forces publicly agree to not target the southern German town. You see, even the Allies didn't bomb it, you know, it was all, it's all a setup, you know. It's a conspiracy. It was not classified as a significant military target, you know, of course not, throughout the war. And for that reason, the town still maintains many of its original features. However, much darker things were afoot in Ravensburg once the war began. Eugen Schwab continued to manage the National Socialist Model Company for Escher Wies, and the Swiss company would aid the Nazi Wehrmacht, produce significant weapons of war, as well as, 
as more basic armaments. The Ashavis company, you know, and it's next to the Swiss border, you know, so they can all they can get all the goodies from Switzerland uh, into that company, and then it seems that it comes all out of that company. But no, it was all produced in Switzerland. I tell you, I'll show you it on the map afterwards. The Ashavis company, and if it was not the whole products, you know, coming out of Switzerland, which happened, then, you know, the metals and because Germany couldn't import any more things, but the Swiss still could do this, you know. So this is what happened. The Ashavis company was a leader in large turbine technology for hydroelectric dams and power plants, but they also manufactured parts for German fighter planes. They were also intimately involved in much more sinister projects happening behind the scenes, which, if completed, could have changed the outcome of the war. Uh, I'll open up a new window because it cuts something off here. From this point, the article traces how some of Eshavi's hydro turbine technology made it into the Nazi atom bomb project via Norsk heavy water production plants in Norway. Here the article goes a bit uh, awry, claiming that heavy water was vital for the production of plutonium for that project. As I've out outlined in my book, Reich of the Black Sun, the German project, while it knew of the possibility of plutonium. Well, okay, well, I, I'll let you read it yourself and um, just punch pause. So they were working on the bomb, making flamethrowers, parts for um, fighter planes, etc., etc. And it was the father of uh, Klaus uh, Schwab already in the um, in the great reset business with an atom bomb eh? and uh, this is interesting they they you know they compare him with um, Stavro Blofeld Spectre from the James Bond movies and of course yeah it's all based on uh, I mean uh, Ian Fleming, he was uh, he was working in during the war in that line of um, things. Uh. Ravensburg, Germany, where Klausi was born and where the Escher Wies Nazi company is situated, lies right next to Switzerland in the so-called Swiss buffer zone of the ethnic Swiss all around Switzerland, when during the 30-year war from 1618 to 1648, Swiss mercenaries murdered the entire population around Switzerland to the last child. So the Swissies could take over repopulate in order to make that strategical buffer zone around the main base of all evil. Another one of those Klaus Schwab great resets, so to say. So here, Ravensburg is the um, Eschavis Nazi company. So here is Switzerland, here's Geneva, here's Bern, the capital, here's Basel with the Bank of International Settlements, here's the border, like this, this is Bodensee, and here's Austria, and the border goes like this, Liechtenstein, and here Varesa, Locarno, this is Italy, uh, Zermatt, Matterhorn, uh, so that is Switzerland, right? Eh? And here's Ravensburg. It's right at the Swiss border. And this is all around Switzerland, which I already explained to you, is the Swiss buffer zone. And here Schaffhausen. Uh, in this area, I infiltrated the Swiss octagon. And you see it's right next to Ravensburg as well, you know. 
So during the war, you know, um, the Germans, they couldn't get many, you know, resources for the um, ground resources, you know, for the, uh, for the war industry, like, you know, metals and, and all sort of things. So they just got it from Switzerland, you know, into Ravensburg. I mean, I mean that only Germ the Germans and the Swiss involved. I mean, who's who's going to to check that out, eh? And even complete weapon systems already, uh, like Erlikon in Zurich, you know, the um, the flak cannons and everything. It went directly here to Ravensburg. Uh, you know, guns that were manufactured in Switzerland, you know, directly here. Um, so the buffer zone, yeah, around Switzerland, which is the base of the pharistocracy. So here is the father of Klaus Schwab, Eugen Wilhelm Schwab. And he's, he's a bit older already. And, um, who was the director of that very dangerous Nazi, Swiss Nazi factory, uh, Escher Wies, by the um, uh, Escher vom Glas um, aristocracy. So the father, like 20 years after the war, so a little bit older. And here, a bit old, uh, younger, and I must say, the alleged father of Klaus Schwab, um, Eugen Wilhelm Schwab, because there are a lot of rumors about it, and um, I just couldn't verify it. So, but if you look at the face, it's um, yeah, it's very likely this really is the father and the um, the director of that Nazi factory, you know, keeping concentration camp inmates and uh, killing people and uh, yeah I mean it's a long time ago it's 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 quite hard so I say I repeat these are the alleged pictures during the wartime of Eugen Wilhelm uh, Schwab but uh, one thing is sure, he was the director of the Escherwies company in Ravensburg. So here you can see father and son, or son and father. This is Klaus Schwab, and we can all see the resemblance. And here is the alleged uh, Eugen Wilhelm Schwab, the father. And um, he must have worn some some Nazi uniform in these days. Eh? That's, of course, that's sure. But again, I couldn't verify it. So, but I think it's, uh, it must be um, pretty authentic. Yeah. But I must say alleged, it's an alleged picture. So I hear some more about it. We pick up the story with Schwab's father, Eugen, a manager for a Swiss-German company, Escher Wies, in Schwab's hometown of Ravensburg. The allegations are revealing. I'll let you read it yourself. Just punch pause. And... Uh, yeah, Eugen Schwab continued to manage the National Socialist Model Company. You know, great reset stuff, eh? For Escher Wies. So now you know where the name Escher comes from, eh? And where the name Wies is coming from. You won't, you won't find that here in these sort of articles. And I think it's important because you have to know, I mean, where does the company come from? That's very, very important. because. They're not just ordinary Swiss, it's the aristocracy. So this is what I, you know, wanted to add to all this here, where this, where it all comes from. And, um, well, okay, I'll let, I'll let you read it yourself. And, uh, you know, 3,600 forced laborers. 
they had the, their own little concentration camp. Yeah, it says, Escher Wies maintained a small special camp for forced laborers on the factory premises. That's, that's the Escher from Glass family. You know, they did it with uh, Nubians in the America, the cotton pickers, children slaves, uh, Second World War slaves here, you name it. And it goes on and it goes on. Now the good old son is, you know, doing the same thing with his great reset. Uh, this is a dynasty, you know, they're, they're all, they're all together. Conspiracies are very real. And related to the, as I said, to the concentration camp slaves, um, you know, Switzerland uh, was very, very much involved uh, into the slavery, um, into, um, into the Americas. We t I'll read it for you a little bit. We tend to associate the history of slavery with European ports that specialize in slaving. Cadiz, uh, Bristol, Liverpool, Nantes and Middleburg are cities that spring to mind. The French-speaking city of Neuchâtel in Switzerland is situated on the shoreline of Lake Neuchâtel within the canton of the same name in the mountainous Jura region. Not a port in sight, in spite of being a landlocked country without colonies of its own. This and other Swiss cities profited from the Atlantic slave trade. It's incredible, you know. A lack of colonial ambitions helped the Swiss gain a working relationship with Europe's main empire builders. Swiss mercenaries were taken on by the Dutch and British East India companies. I already told you about this 12 years ago. From the beginning of the 17th century in 1800, when black slaves on the island of Hispaniola revolted against their French colonial masters, Napoleon sent 600 Swiss troops to fight them. Well, they, 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 they were the Swissies were deep in it. But then again, I oh, hear this: the family of Alfred Escher, a major fi figure in the development of modern Switzerland, ran a plantation run with slave labor. And Alfred Escher, that's the one who founded the Swiss Credit Suisse. By that time, the name was. Um, uh, well, I had another name already, so you read it yourself. There's a lot of names, you know. It's just too much, too many names to, yeah. But anyway, it's it's all in the in these. Uh, this clean, neutral, innocent country. <laughs> they don't give a damn about human rights. And homie Ross knows all about it and his children. They terrorized me for 25 years. That's a quarter of a century. And here's another article, how Switzerland profited from colonialism. Well, Nazism was also colonialism. Oh. It's, it's just another name. You know, they just changed names and jackets and... Oh, the Swiss connection is very real, very dangerous, and extremely ruthless. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies on covered means for expanding its sphere of influence on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. Hey, Swissy, I know what you did.